Welcome to the 22nd year of the NSF REU Symposium. Uh, the program was begun by Provost Hol Holbrook and Harris at UGA and uh, Clark Atlanta University. Uh, and we've uh, uh, been made possible by uh, 20 years of support by the National Science Foundation and more recently by the Department of Energy. Um, we are also uh, very grateful for the support by Dean Dorsey of the College of Arts and Sciences and the Institute of Bioinformatics and the Departments of Genetics, as well as uh, Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Alan Dorsey. He himself has run an REU program uh, in his past life uh, <clears throat> at uh, University of Florida and he's going to uh, welcome all of the speakers that we have today. Thank you very much for uh, joining us, Dr. Dorsey. Great. Thank you, Dr. Arnold, for that kind introduction and for the invitation to join you here today. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody. I know it's been a lot of hard work, but I hope that your work over the summer has been both uh, stimulating and fun. I'm a big fan of undergraduate research. My experience goes way back to the summer of 1977 when I was able to participate in a summer research program for high school students in the Washington, D.C. area. I had the opportunity to work at the National Bureau of Standards in Gaithersburg, Maryland. Uh, it's now called the National Institutes for Standards and Technology, or NIST. I worked on a project that involved precision polarimetry measurements of sucrose solutions. The details are now a little fuzzy, but I do recall enjoying working in a lab alongside PhD chemists and physicists. My initial participation turned into an ongoing summer job. I was fortunate to work at MBS during every summer as an undergraduate, working on a variety of projects alongside scientists and engineers. These experiences influenced my decision on a course of study in college, and I eventually majored in physics. I went on to earn a PhD in physics and became a faculty member at the University of Virginia and then at the University of Florida. While at UF, I decided it was time to pay back the benefits I earned from my undergraduate research experience. And in 1999, I co-founded a summer REU program in UF's physics department. We would bring 15 students to Gainesville every summer to conduct research in materials physics. I served as the research mentor for several of the students, and it's gratifying that some of them are now faculty members at colleges and universities around the country. I occasionally bump into them at professional meetings and conferences. Why is undergraduate research so important? It's the authentic experience of discovery, the pleasure of finding things out, to quote the irascible 20th century physicist and Nobel laureate Richard Feynman. It's about discovering and learning something that nobody else knew, or at least they didn't know it at the time and in the way that you know it. It's learning about new scientific techniques, working in teams and alongside one of our talented UGA scientists. It's presenting the fruits of your work in accessible terms to your peers and to others. It's also about dealing with failure. Scientific research seldom proceeds in a linear fashion. It's always fraught with pitfalls and failed experiments, dead ends and misconceptions. Sometimes things go, more things go wrong than right and practicing scientists develop patience, persistence and perseverance, which are the important life skills that you can well apply outside of your scientific pursuits. And speaking of which, I know that many of you will be thinking about graduate programs soon, and as good students, I'm sure you'll have many options from which to choose. I hope that you'll seriously consider the University of Georgia as one of your options. As I'm sure you've observed, we have outstanding faculty and great facilities. Please stay in touch with your research mentor as you consider your options. If offered a spot in one of our graduate programs, I hope that you'll commit to the G. I hope that your summer was productive and stimulating. I expect that you'll have a better idea of the hard work involved in scientific research and hopefully you've enjoyed, experienced the joy of discovery. 
I wish you all the best in your future academic endeavors. Thank you and have a great symposium. And thank you for all your support for this program. I'm very grateful and you're a key component on its success. So our first speaker is, uh, <clears throat> can come from uh, Florida State University. Uh, her name's Alexis Molina. Uh, and I think she's taken uh, Dr. Dorsey's recommendation to heart. Uh, she, she did a uh, post back with us and she hopefully will be joining us in the fall, so, which is just a, a few weeks away. And she is gonna talk about RNA profiling of quorum sensing in the model uh, genetic system, the Rosperacrasa. Welcome, Alexis. Hi, everyone. Um, so like Dr. Arnold said, I um, am from Florida State University. Uh, I graduated this last fall and I'll be attending UGA for graduate school. Um, so this project was especially exciting for me because I got to get a little uh, head start on that. Um, so for the NSF FGCB program, uh, I wanted to continue doing some transcriptional research. I had done some in my undergraduate, so I wanted to keep fostering that interest. Uh, so my project this summer was RNA profiling of quorum sensing in Neurospora crassa. Uh, so for some background, Neurospora crassa is a fungus that's often used as a model to study eukaryotic genomics um, because it's much easier to work with than organisms like human or animal cells uh, to study the same thing of eukaryotic um, organisms. So this fungus can be easily maintained, manipulated and crossed in the lab, which is why we chose to use it. Um, and back in 2019, uh, at the time he was a, a PhD candidate, but Dr. Michael Judge found that Neurospora crassa is a density dependent fungus, um, which means it has different metabolic profiles depending on whether it's cultured in high or low density. Um, this implies that there is some cell-to-cell -cell communication in order for the cells to be aware of neighboring cells and the density of those neighboring cells. So our theory is that this communication happens through chemical sensing, which is also known as quorum sensing, um, and that these chemicals are metabolites that are being produced. So these metabolites are likely the chemical signals uh, released for the quorum sensing. And uh, as we know, metabolites are produced by RNA products such as proteins. Uh, so if we follow this back, we can uh, see some transcriptional data. So we currently have the metabolic data from the high and low density samples all laid out, thanks to uh, Michael Judge and Dr. Yue. Uh, and since we've observed uh, these trends of high and low density, we wanted to explore the transcriptional component that produces all of these metabolites. So we can do this by uh, RNA profiling through an RNA-seq analysis, essentially. So we have a few objectives that we needed to get through um, in order to obtain an RNA-seq. So first we needed to optimize a collection protocol so we could obtain accurate RNA profiles. We know that RNA profiles change within as little as 15 minutes. So we wanted this process to be as efficient as possible where we could pull a sample out of incubation and freeze it as quickly as possible. Um, and next we needed to look at our metabolic data in order to identify any significant time points based on the fluctuation of these metabolites. And finally, we would compare the RNA profiles of high and low density neurospora through the RNA-seq. So our uh, low volume protocol development began with um, the 15 ml culture that we were currently using in the lab. Um, this culture produced a lot more biomass than we needed. As you may know, for an RNA extraction, you need between 30 to 80 milligrams of biomass, a uh, 15 ml culture would produce way too much. So uh, we wanted to minimize that. And so I proposed scaling down to a 3 ml system uh, and that would save us some time with uh, autoclaving our flasks, cleaning them uh, and just saving on general biomass and time for preparation. So for this uh, low volume protocol, um, we just used a QAX strain in order to uh, just consolidate what we were looking at. The QAX strain uh, is, shows a more dramatic metabolite expression, so it's easier for us to rely on and compare data from it. Um, so for the high density samples, we scaled down to 0.4 grams per 3 ml of media, and for low density samples, we scaled down to 0.06 grams per 3 ml of media. 
Um, and for measuring the metabolites uh, for comparison, we took time points at two, four, and 24 hours uh, because that's what was consistent with our current uh, models for ethanol production for the 15 ml system. Um, and for the smaller container, uh, we used test tubes that I've previously used when I studied E. coli. Uh, the test tubes allow for uh, ventilation through the top without having an open container in your shaker. Um, so I thought that might be ideal. And we basically just tilted it on its side in a tube rack inside of the shaker so that you would also have enough surface area uh, to be comparable to the flask that system that we were using before. Um, we also, in doing the RNA purifications, realized that there were some problems with salt contamination since the samples are cultured in Bogle media. Uh, it has a high salt content. So we uh, wanted to mitigate this and realized that we could rinse the sample with sterile water in order to wash off the Bogle media that it's cultured in before we freeze it. So we had to try a couple different methods of that. Um, one was a stir method where we took the dried biomass and put it into 50 ml of water, stirred it around, and then dried it again. And then the other one was a rinse method where on the same uh, filter that it was being dried, we simply poured sterile water over it um, and let it dry that way. Um, and lastly, the RNA purification protocol specified to use under 100 milligrams of biomass. And we found that uh, when we used between 30 to 80 milligrams of biomass, that was the ideal um, concentration. We were getting better concentration yields from that as opposed to using a higher uh, beginning biomass. So we had to validate uh, these three things. So we started with um, NMR data to compare the ethanol production to see if this uh, 3ML protocol was even viable. Um, so here we compare uh, CVIM, CIVM uh, NMR data from Dr. Yim Ping and Dr. Michael Judge. So um, here where the arrows are pointing up top on the blue line, you can see um, a high density sample of, that shows the ethanol production um, of high density neurospora. And down here on the bottom one, you can see uh, the low density sample ethanol production. And we wanted to see the same trend here happening at two, four, and 24 hours. Um, and when you look over here to the right, this is our 3ML systems ethanol production. And um, we realized that there's a peak up here way at 24 hours. Um, that is actually because it wasn't uh, CIVM data. It was uh, taken at various time points uh, for this graph on the right. So. Uh, the fact that we see these trends from uh, zero, two to four is basically what we were trying to see. So with that validation, we could then move on to, um, to optimizing our um, RNA extraction. So here uh, is some data from uh, Nanodrop after I've done the RNA extraction for triplicates at high and low density. Um, time points didn't matter for this part because we were just trying to get a good RNA yield and seeing which wash method worked as well as which biomass amount would be ideal. Um, so we found that uh, neither of those really had a significant impact on the concentration. Um, what mattered was that we did rinse it um, and that we did use between 30 to 80 uh, milligrams of biomass. Um, and I may have mentioned that we uh, settled on the rinse method because it saved time, as we talked about before. RNA is very time sensitive. So we, the quicker we can get it out of that incubator and into the liquid nitrogen, the better. The rinse method was a lot faster than mixing it around in a separate tube. So we stuck with the rinse method and uh, made sure to keep our quantities between 30 and 80 milligrams. Um, so now I'd like to talk about our post-validation aims now that we've validated our protocol. So we can move on to our aims of isolating and analyzing the RNA profiles of high and low density samples at time points that are correlated with a metabolic change. Um, by doing this, we can start to identify genes that are associated with differential expression at high and low density in neurospora crassa. So here's an example of the CIVM NMR data um, that uh, came from Dr. Yue and Michael Judge. Um, this is unpublished data of uh, their metabolic study. So this is a metabolite G1P um, and its production in both wild type and QAX strains uh, from a continuous in vivo monitoring of metabolism by NMR. 
Um, it shows a fluctuation of metabolite production over 14 hours, and it's an example of how we chose our time points of interest. So you can see here that there's a steady increase until a peak at two hours and four hours, uh, up here on this yellow line and then down here on these orange lines. So uh, then there's a steady decrease until it eventually plateaus. So we know transcription occurs before protein production as shown with the central dogma model. So I chose a time point that would anticipate these changes um, that are happening since transcription associated with these changes is my focus. So here is just uh, some more examples of other metabolites that were observed um, and used to find our time points of one, two, and six hours that we settled on for uh, studying transcription. Um, these were also provided by Dr. Yue and Dr. Michael Judge and are an example of all the space that we're looking to explore um, for transcriptional regulation and activity. Um, so here I just wanted to give an overview of our procedure now that we've established it from top to bottom, including the time points. So we begin by inoculating our desired strain of Neurospora crassa, and the next day we're able to wash and aliquot the biomass according to high and low density. Uh, next, we incubate the high and low density samples for one, two, and six hours, and flash freeze them in liquid nitrogen once each has been washed with sterile water through the rinse method that we talked about. Um, once all the samples are collected, uh, we grind the samples in aliquot 30 to 80 milligrams of the crushed powder to use for RNA extraction. And lastly, once the RNA is all extracted, we will send it to the core facilities for an RNA seq, at which point we can analyze the data when it's returned to us. Um, so here I wanted to talk a bit about the RNA seq that the core facility will be doing. Um, so they use an alumina my seq for our reads. And um, so they begin with a Kappa stranded RNA library preparation, which is basically just the, the method Illumina uses for the first step of RNA-seq, which is creation of libraries. It starts by fragmenting the RNA using heat and magnesium, and then creates libraries with an adapter sequence and a randomized barcode. Um, and the adapter sequence allows um, the RNA sequences to bind to the flow cell that it'll be applied to, uh, which has a complementary P7 and P5 primers um, that bind to the complementary adapter sequences. Um, so once it's bound on both ends, the P5 end is cleaved and can then be amplified. After this, they're tagged with the fluorescently labeled nucleotides in order to give reads and sequence the RNA. Um, and this all happens within the flow, flow cell, which I thought was really cool. Um, and once this is completed, the raw data can be transferred to a pipeline to organize which RNA sequences are associated with reasons of DNA. Um, and from this information, we can finally interpret our results um, to see which genes are fluctuating with association to metabolic changes at the focus time points. And as we know, sometimes you won't always get um, the exact cause of that fluctuation of metabolites, but we'll likely see an association, um, which is the big thing, is we can always go back and do more time points when we find something interesting, um, but we wanted to get a general baseline with this experiment. Um, so for our future work, uh, it's going to begin with, uh, first of all, receiving uh, those RNA-seq results um, from the core facilities. And that should take about four to five weeks once it's sent off. Um, right now, I have all the RNA extractions done. And um, then we'll be able to identify the genes that are differentially expressed in anticipation of metabolic changes. Um, overall, this is going to help us understand which genes regulate quorum sensing in Neurospora crassa. And like we talked about, that's a model for eukaryotes, which is pretty exciting stuff because then we can talk about um, transcriptional regula regulation mechanisms as a whole. Um, so yeah, that's a pretty exciting part to me. Um, and for my acknowledgments, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Arnold for letting me be in his lab and being a very helpful mentor. Dr. Yanping Gao for also being a very helpful mentor and teaching me just about everything about fungus uh, as I'm coming from a bacterial background. Um, Dr. Yue for uh, his input and uh, all of his uh, amazing work with the metabolites. Uh, Dr. R. Edison for also supporting us with the NMR and um, a lot of helpful feedback about this project and guidance with it. Uh, Dr. Michael Judge for uh, the same things that UA provided um, and sort of paving a little path for me here in um, Dr. Arnold's lab. And Dr. Uh, and uh, PhD student uh, Zarif Hossein for also helping me through wet lab and uh, being very encouraging through the process. Um, so yeah, now I'll take any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Alex.
So um, the, the audience is welcome to post questions. I, I think there's a little box or something at the bottom of the screen which you can then uh, post the question and I'll, I'll read it so the rest of the audience can uh, look at it and also there'll be, it'll probably come on the screen as well. So while you're t busy typing away, I'll just ask, ask, ask uh, maybe a question. And um, <clears throat> where do you think the quorum sensing uh, plays a role in the organism's uh, life history? What do you think it's affecting? You know, what processes? Um, I think it could be affecting um, something associated with uh, resource conserving. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe if it's at a higher density, it's going to try to conserve its resources, grow a little more slowly, as opposed to low density where it can take up more space, um, mm -hmm. grow and grow and grow, and it, it'll be promoted to do that. Because um, we've we've even seen in the cultures when we let them when they get a little funky, you know, the low density cultures will um, will form these weird clumps um, mm -hmm. and just become more dense in general, uh, as opposed to the high density and the really viable um, inoculations that are uh, growing just fine and pretty steady pace all throughout. Mm -hmm. And so in the high density cultures, they're in more competition. Mm -hmm. And um, that's where the organism is, is producing ethanol. And so maybe any, any thoughts why it's doing that at, at high density? Um, yeah, I think it could also probably be because you're going to see more ethanol production maybe because um, there's more like a higher number of cells. So we see a higher number of okay. like ethanol there. Um, okay. Uh, but in terms of the increase that we see that spike in the NMR data, um, right. I think maybe they could also be supporting each other in some way. Maybe the metabolites actually help each other or uh -huh. help the other cells, the neighboring cells in some way. Um, uh -huh. Or maybe in getting in having more cells, they get more input and then can more properly gauge their surroundings and what resources uh -huh. are available. Um, uh -huh. So I think it could, um, you know, it's all regulation. It's all... Um, a nice little right. balance. Um, okay. So let me see if there are any questions uh, from the audience. Okay, so the audience is uh, just gearing up, I guess. Um, so in some contexts, uh, ethanol production and yeast is a, acts as an antibiotic. And mm -hmm. so if you've got high density cultures, the uh, ethanol might be protecting all those, all those cells. What, what do you think of that as a speculation? Um, I really love that idea. I think that's awesome. Um, yeah. I, I, think that's, I think that's very viable. I mean, obviously it's gonna regulate itself so that it doesn't produce too much ethanol to where it starts killing the neighboring cells. But I think that's awesome that, right. um, yeah, I do think that's a viable theory. Um, absolutely, I would never cross that off the table. I mean, right. we're going to study it from other models, and yeast should absolutely right. be on the table as well. Right. Uh, so, so, do you think the quorum sensing system has anything to do with the clock behavior of the the organism? Hundred percent. Yeah, I think. Um, yeah, <laughs> um, I. I don't know that it is the absolute cause. I don't think any one thing is going to be the absolute cause. I think it's a lot of um, just regulation mm -hmm. between um, mm -hmm. some mechanism inside the cell and then feedback from its surroundings. I think it's a balance mm -hmm. of both. So I don't think it's the entire uh, mm -hmm. entirely responsible for the clock timing and mm -hmm. um, that regulation, but I do think it plays a really significant role in it. So that's why I'm especially excited to see what kind of results we get from this and kind of keep going into this one. That's why I like transcription so much. Because um, right. we get to also read the feedback that it's getting from external stimulus. so. 
this is this is wonderful so i guess if we no questions what we'll do is move to the next speaker and thank you so much and alan dorsey seemed to forgive you from being the florida state university st student <laughs> so we'll move on now uh to skylar gay uh, she is going to be going this fall to um, the University of Virginia, Charlottesville, right north of us. And uh, she just completed her degree at uh, West Virginia Community College. And uh, she's been working on uh, the COVID project uh, uh, to understand disease transmission. So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce her and she's going to talk about TransRate, a software tool that estimates transmission uh, rate uh, using a cladistic method from DNA sequences of the virus. Welcome, Skylar. Thank you so much, Dr. Arnold, for that introduction. Um, hello, everyone. My project this summer is kind of what Dr. Arnold said. It's a, an extension of previous work of ours to understand the transmission of the COVID-19 pandemic from a qualitative perspective. So this summer, Drs. Jonathan Arnold, Liang Liu, and myself sought a quantitative view of the transmission of the early COVID-19 pandemic. So I would like to present TransRate a cladistic method of transmission rate estimation. The emergence of SARS-CoV-2 on December 31st, 2019, introduced questions for scientists, including how can we fully comprehend and prevent the transmission of this new epidemic? The CDC released guidelines for travel and masking to slow the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic. So I would like to like stop for a second. I'd like to ask you to consider something. Did we, at the time, have a solid understanding of the transmission rates to make effective and conclusive recommendations to the public? Using mitochondrial DNA, Montgomery Slatkin and Wayne Madison developed a novel technique in 1989 for calculating the, gene, the amount of gene flow between two populations. With this approach, we rely on the two population island model and assume a constant rate of migration. By defining the transmission rate of the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic as the contact probability times the infection rate, we may utilize Madison and Slatkin's methodology for gene flow estimation to determine the average transmission rate of the early pandemic. Simulations of coalescent and, or coalescence and migration were used to support this approach. I created a two population coalescent using the Phibase R package. In R, I constructed a function used to simulate migration on a coalescent. This function is generalized to be used in two or more population coalescents. I developed an R function to estimate the transmission rate in the coalescent using the, est or the estimation method based on Madison and Slatkin's gene flow calculation experiment. I conducted 100 simulations of two populations with 3,000 individuals each at various migration rates and calculated a 95% confidence interval for each migration rate. After these experiments confirmed the accuracy of the estimation method, I conducted an analysis of, the of a data set of whole genome sequencing data for about 40,000 of the earliest cases of SARS-CoV-2. These data were arranged into 35 clades by identifying samples as being at least 80% from one locality or having at least 80% bootstrap support. My analysis used a similar methodology for calculating transmission rate estimates on a data set of these early COVID-19 cases. Uh, and these, I took these cases between three time points, January, February, and March. To gain the best possible understanding of transmission rates and the efficacy of guidelines in individual populations, I performed estimate calculations between continents at the three unique time points I mentioned earlier and averaged the estimates at each time point to have the best understanding possible. So to confirm the efficacy of the transmission rate estimation method, 
I calculated a confidence interval and 2,000 simulations and estimations with 100 estimates per each expected transmission rate. The mean square error of these estimates is approximately 1.9 times 10 to the negative seventh. To get a better look at this data, I plotted my findings. This analysis results in an R-squared value of 1. Now, while this simulation data set looks great, let's take a look at some real data. While the simulation showed a coalescent of two populations and a migration of a migration events based on a migration rate between these populations, I wanted to see what this method would look like when applied to the COVID-19 data set. My analysis of the COVID-19 data set revealed fascinating results about the early spread of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. I wanna focus on two major time points though, February and March. So in February, 2020, notable transmission occurred between the Americas, which include North America, Central America, and South America, and Asia. There was also notable transmission between Asia and Europe, as well as Asia and Oceania. The average transmission rate for this time point is approximately 6.8%. In March, the estimates indicate a higher number of transmission events between the observed populations. The average transmission rate for this time point is approximately 2.3%. Seeing a transmission, transmission rate estimation method being used in the analysis of real data shined a light on the value of this estimation method in the scientific community. A transmission rate estimates techniques importance to the scientific community was really highlighted in this. So I wanted to take a look at the three time points I observed, January, February, and March. The highest observed transmission rate estimate occurred between February 1st and 29th of 2020. Many countries began restricting travel in March of 2020, which may account for the lower transmission rate between continents. However, as the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic spread within populations, the data would likely reflect a higher transmission rate within a single population. According to an article published by the Washington Post on October 10th of 2020, by March 25th of 2020, the number of nations that had imposed travel restrictions during this pandemic had increased to 136. So about just over halfway through March, we were looking at a significant number of countries that had a very um, tight restriction ban. So the World Health Organization reported by March 27th of 2020, the United States alone had almost 70,000 total confirmed cases due to local transmission. Early testing for the U.S. outbreak was available only to those with a history of travel to China, which made it difficult to identify cases and infections among foreign visitors from other countries. Less than 100 tests were carried out by American public health authorities prior to March. A lack of testing during the January and February time points led to many undiagnosed cases and few whole, whole genome sequences. The lack of transmission reflected in the January time point is likely due to this, lack, especially due to the lack of the sequencing, which this data set was based upon. If the cases in the U.S. and many other countries affected by the COVID-19 were categorized as local transmissions by March 27th, we can assume that a lowered number of transmissions from other countries or continents, which is reflected in this elapsed average transmission rate figure. So I saw the value in the public availability of this R code, and I built TransRate. This R package utilizes the methodology in the previous experiments to provide users with tools to both quantitatively and qualitatively analyze data of an epidemic. TransRate contains functions for migration simulations on a coalescent, airplane plots of transmission events, and transmission rate estimation between two or more populations. This package, available on GitHub, also contains sample data, allowing users to demonstrate functions on a sample before inputting their own data. The value of this methodology is further evident as we understand the need for preparation for future outbreaks. This allows scientists to best understand the efficacy of various guidelines and recommendations to slow the spread of viral infections between two or more populations. 
slowing the spread of future outbreaks can help save lives and prevent many related complications. By defining the transmission rate as the infection prob or as the infection rate times contact probability, the scientific community can utilize the findings of Slatkin and Madison to realize the significance and effectiveness of regulations during future epidemics and outbreaks. That's why this research is so incredibly important, not only to garner knowledge from our data, but to affect change in our community and protect those around us. Um, I would like to, in my acknowledgement slide, uh, thank doctors Jonathan Arnold and Liang Liu for all of their help and support on their on this project. They have been um, such amazing mentors and their many years of knowledge and experience in this topic has truly made this REU very special. Um, to those in the audience who are watching my family and friends, thank you so much for your support. Um, and from every or to everyone at the University of Georgia, um, you guys have made this experience so incredibly special. Um, all of you who have taught me how to code, uh, who have provided so much help and advice and suggestions, um, thank you so much. Uh, and to the NSF for making this possible. Uh, also, Michael, thank you. Uh, all of this R code knowledge is definitely help from you. So thank you. Um, so I would like to ask, do y'all have any questions? <laughs> So, yeah, it, it, you can hit the little bottom button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, oh, there's your first question. Here we go. And I'm going to read it to you. Hi, can we use the quorum sensing in commercial production? Oh, that's from the last speaker. <laughs> oh, well, um, is there a, the next one? Yeah, let's see. Okay. Yeah, okay. So I'm going to just ask maybe a question while you guys uh, type something in. Um, the uh, why why did you focus on the early part of the pandemic? That's that's a very interesting and spe specific focus to your work. Yeah. Absolutely. So I focused on the early part of the pandemic, and this was also in partnership with another project that I was on at the University of Georgia last summer. We were seeking to understand a better origin of the pandemic and mainly how the transmission occurred. So my interest when I was building trans rate and looking at the transmission rate estimations in the early pandemic was to understand how did the mask and travel guidelines really affect? Did, did they help? Did they hinder? What was the um, kind of mm -hmm. usefulness of that and the efficiency within the population? And something that I kind of noticed is um, I'm going to swap back to a previous slide just because I wanted to share this. In January, we look at a 0% transmission rate. Well, we know that's not true because we have early cases in the United States as early as mid-January, as well as other countries. So this could also be due to a lack of testing. As I mentioned earlier, um, a lack of testing restricting um, those being tested only to those with a travel uh, history in China that eliminated any possible testing for those who had traveled to other countries that had the COVID-19 virus. So I think something that I've learned is an increase in testing and sequencing of those samples is definitely beneficial, especially as we see kind of in this early January section of the data. Um, but I think we can see in March, we have a lower transmission rate between populations. So that shows that our, our travel bans did do something to limit transmission between populations. However, that does raise the question of the transmission rates within those populations. Okay. And there, here's your question. Following up with Dr. Arnold's question, how can we apply the gain knowledge to monkeypox? Oh, excellent question. Um, as we see more cases of monkeypox rise, I think it's definitely important as much testing as possible, as much if we are able to sequence as possible. Building up this data set will definitely help. And as much as um, we can to understand what restrictions need to be set in place or what guidelines can be provided by public health authorities, especially in the United States, um, to kind of help 
prevent the spread of monkeypox. So applying this, having as many sequences as possible to build up the data set, as well as learning from our data. I mean, it's not just about building the data. We have to learn from that. And that's definitely something that I think is very important in the monkeypox outbreak. And while I'm waiting for another question, I'll just ask one. Did, uh, did you notice any effect of the availability of the sequence data on your ability to characterize transmission rate absolutely. between the continents? Yeah, absolutely. So when we first pulled this data, I mean, I think we pulled first in mid-2020. So when we first pulled that, we had about a uh, what was it? Five, six thousand sequences at that point. So mm -hmm. as you can see, we had a jump to about forty thousand sequences of whole uh, whole genome sequences of SARS-CoV-2 virus. So when we were looking at that, the first transmission estimates that we were performing, we didn't see countries such as Italy. I mean, we all remember the large outbreak in Italy and how that hit the news. So we looked at that and automatically we were like, hold on, there's something up here. So as we refresh data, having more data allowed for a more accurate transmission rate because we had more sequences from different areas. Now we can also see, um, and I saw this just in my own observations of the data, we had very limited um, sequences from uh, especially South America. So when we're looking at South America, there may be fewer testing sites available, maybe less data production going on there. So that does not, that kind of hinders looking at the transmission rate estimate within that continent. Um, so I think definitely the more data that we can have in this, again, that's why I said the more testing that's available to individuals, uh, the less undiagnosed um, cases that we can have will definitely lead to a more accurate transmission rate and a better understanding of how we can affect um, change within that. So I, this is on a more personal note. Um, where where do you think this project is taking you career wise? Awesome. Um, so definitely on a personal note, uh, this so kind of some next goals with this project. We are looking to change the migration rate simulation a little bit to instead of reflecting a binomial distribution to reflecting a Poisson distribution. So I think that that will definitely be interesting, adding a little more, as Dr. Arnold puts it, noise to the curve. Um, so that will definitely be interesting. Uh, but the plan for this project is to publish the trans rate program. Um, and kind of get that off the ground. But in terms of my career, uh, my goal is to finish out my undergraduate degree at the University of Virginia. And my goal after that is to go into a PhD program. I haven't figured out where yet. That's still in the works. Um, but yeah, definitely. Um, and genetics is definitely such a field of interest for me. And this project has just further proved that. Well, th thank you for the wonderful job on this pr project and uh, we we'll ho hope you consider UGA like Dean Dorsey suggested. Of course. Hey, so. of course. <laughs> um, thank you, Dr. Arnold, so much. Okay. So um, it's now my pleasure to introduce William Lance. Uh, he is... Um, on a, a field, actually a combination of field and experimental work to understand the, the symbiosis between uh, fungi and the root systems of land plants. Uh, he uh, completed his PhD, uh, his undergraduate degree uh, recently at uh, UGA. And uh, here he's been an, an essential part of a large-scale genome-wide association study of, of this symbiosis uh, conducted in the field in Watkinsville, Georgia. It's my pleasure to introduce William, and welcome. Hey, thanks, Dr. Arnold. Um, just, uh, you know, uh, again, uh, again, thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm William Lance. Um, Again, Dr. Allen talked about it, but uh, I'll be talking to you guys a little bit about uh, what I've been working on this summer. Um, I've been involved with a very long kind of ongoing study 
um, genome-wide association between sorghum and our muscular mycorrhizae fungi. Um, and just quickly, I wanted to go ahead and give some thanks um, to the people that kind of helped me work through a lot of this stuff. Um, my mentor, Shufan, uh, Phil, Tom, um, Dr. Jonathan Arnold, uh, my PI, and then Katrine and Jeff, uh, Katrine Davis, Devos, and Jeff Bennettson. Um, so just a little bit of background for you guys. Um, uh, the kind of fungus that we're looking at, and you guys are going to hear a lot more about this with some of my peers. They're going to talk about more about this later. Um, but it's a fungus where the spores kind of naturally occur in the soil. Um, it interacts with a huge variety of plant life. Um, and basically what you're getting um, is the fungus interacts with the plant in a way that kind of extends the root network of the plant to basically help it kind of bring in more nutrients for the plant, help the plant out a little bit. You get effects like uh, better nutrient uptake, especially with nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, you get some drought tolerance. Um, and then you get uh, it really helps uh, prime the plant's defenses. And in exchange, the AMF is taking away from the plant um, some sugars and lipids. And you can see in this graphic right here, um, the way that the fungus interacts within the soil to kind of extend the root network. Um, you see that the fungus actually invades and is allowed to invade the plant root cells, um, go in there, kind of take over some of the structure of the plant root cell um, and kind of allow for that exchange to happen within the plant root itself. Um, so, and then a little bit of background kind of on this larger project that we're working on. So it's a genome-wide association study, um, meaning that this is like a multi-pronged approach. It really trying to get into some of the details and understand a lot more about how uh, this fungus interacts with uh, plant life. Um, uh, sorghum was chosen in this particular experiment. Um, and uh, basically, you know, over the course of multiple years, multiple harvests, um, we're going to be looking at uh, the root morphology of the sorghum, um, how much AMF uh, you see in the sorghum and what it's looking like in there. Um, the uh, AMF and sorghum gene expression as those two interact. Um, and, you know, then also just like sorghum biomass as a representation of how much um, the AMF is then helping that plant out. And again, you can kind of see uh, in the graphic here, we got the each year we're kind of in a cycle of planting, um, letting the sorghum grow and then harvesting the sorghum and the root system and then taking a look. And you can see in the center of that picture, I've got a uh, slightly more accurate uh, kind of look at what you'd see inside of a plant root cell as the AMF fungus has kind of invaded. Um, again, creating a beneficial relationship, a mostly beneficial relationship uh, for that plant. Um, so kind of talking about the project, um, this year uh, if we had a seven acre plot. Um, we did a soil sample uh, study to kind of make sure we understood what we were planting um, our sorghum in. Um, over uh, the winter, they would planted some winter wheat. Um, so what you see here is kind of the dying winter wheat has kind of been knocked down um, and we've created about 12 plots here um, in, in a little bit of a grid system. Um, these plots uh, were also all going to be getting a slightly different treatment. Um, uh, these were these plots were treated before we planted uh, the sorghum this year. Um, so you have uh, a combination of nitrogen and phosphorus or uh, nothing being added to these plots. So high nitrogen, high phosphorus, uh, high nitrogen and phosphorus, or um, uh, just not really anything. Um, getting a better look here at the experimental design kind of of the field plan. So you can see it's kind of blocked out. Um, here I'm showing you um, a design that was made of the of the uh, field again. Um, so you can see where we've kind of added uh, those treatments randomly um, in these blocks. Um, each block then had, um, we had 337 different genotypes of sorghum that were planted. Each block contained six plants of each genotype um, in, in a small grid. Um, and, uh, and were planted in rows and again, randomly assigned through each block. 
Um, this wasn't personally done by me, this field plan. Um, this is uh, taking care of some of the PhD students in charge of the project. Um, but, you know, definitely I was involved with a lot of the field work, the planting uh, and stuff like that over the summer. Took a lot of people, by the way, that's 25, about 25,000 total plants that were put in this, uh, these plots. Um, so what happened was kind of very recently, kind of as the growing season has ended and we're getting ready to harvest, um, before we did any harvesting, which is actually an ongoing part of the project, um, we went out and we measured height data um, on uh, plants of each accession. Um, and what you can kind of see here is I'm giving you a bit of a graph uh, looking at um, the different treatments and how that affected the plant. So um, one plant of each genotype in each block was measured um, uh, its height. Uh, that's from the ground uh, to the tallest leaf. Um, and what we're seeing here is that there was a pretty significant difference. I know these blocks uh, in this graph look really close, but you have to keep in mind, there's about a thousand data points um, for each treatment. Um, so these small differences that you're seeing there, um, you can see I've given the mean height for each treatment. Those differences uh, have really strong significance um, based on the size of the data collection. Um, this wasn't really, uh, you know, these results right here weren't really that unexpected. Um, the only thing that I think threw uh, at least me for a loop was the fact that while the plants did a little bit better with nitrogen or phosphorus, they did a little bit worse overall with nitrogen and phosphorus. And I think that, that was, uh, again, something that was a little bit unexpected. Um, another ob observation um, as we went out into the field was that um, the plants on the outside of each of the plot just seemed like they weren't doing as well. Um, you know, maybe just expo more exposure to uh, insects, um, you know, the elements, um, wind and stuff like that. So I just did want to take a look at that just to kind of see if that uh, was having a large impact on uh, the way that these plants were growing. So we can kind of take that into consideration as a factor. Um, I plotted plants that were on the exterior of each plot um, and compared them to plants that were on the interior. Um, you can see, again, there is a pretty significant difference there. Um, so we do have some effect um, from plants being on the outside. And I just wanted to have that in mind um, as I went forward and kind of continued to examine this data. Um, I then went and uh, kind of took a look to see if that border effect was then influence, influencing what I was seeing um, from the height data and the treatment. Um, you can see, so I've plotted essentially that border effect against the height data that I was getting. And you can see that um, whether or not the plants were on the border didn't actually really change that much um, about uh, the treatment that was happening. So the treatment effects are still holding true whether or not the plants are on the border or not on the border of the plots. Um, so that was really nice to see um, that we weren't getting too much interference there overall. Um, kind of looking, uh, you know, with this height data, again, I was looking at height data sort of as a proxy for biomass because we hadn't really gotten an opportunity to really focus in on that yet. Um, so with this height data, um, I kind of went through each of the 337 genotypes and I wanted to look for a couple different things and pull out a few genotypes that I thought were res representative of some possible interesting relationships that I think would be really cool to look at um, as the study progressed. Um, and uh, what I pulled out first, and I'm going to call this my boring slide, um, because what I saw, what I wanted to look at first was um, certain plant genotypes that actually did not change a lot. And that's what I've got here. I've pulled out four different genotypes where, you know, there just wasn't a lot of variation by treatment. Um, and I even kind of went into each of these genotypes and really checked to see where they were planted in each of the plots. And for a lot of, for these particular four, um, again, I've just pulled out four representative ones out of 337. Uh, for these four in particular, you know, whether they were planted on the border of these plots um, or on the interior, um, or at a varied treatment, you're seeing about the same plant growth um, kind of no matter what. And I was kind of looking at this and, and I thought this would be a fun starting point because I think that this would be a really good way to start looking at uh, plants that maybe were not affected 
um, by an interaction with AMF. So, you know, they're, in, they're growing the same whether they're in a fertilized or an unfertilized plot, um, meaning that they might not have those beneficial interactions with AMF that are helping them grow, um, or at least not within the particular uh, soil and AMF type that we might have um, in our soil. So um, that's, you know, again, this is the boring stuff where there just wasn't a lot of variation, pro you know, potentially not a lot of interaction with AMF. Um, I then thought it would be fun to compare those genotypes to um, genotypes that showed a lot of variance um, as you went plot to plot, and that possibly indicating a stronger relationship with AMF. Um, I did try and pull genotypes here that didn't maybe have that effect of being on the border as a potential cause for their variation. So I, again, went back pulled out genotypes with a lot of variants, um, looked to see whether or not those plants have been planted on the borders, um, and then further pulled out those plants to get plants that really, again, just showed a lot of variability based on treatment. You can see some of these genotypes here uh, really just, you know, some of these just didn't like phosphorus, you know. Um, they did worse when phosphorus was in the fertilizer. Um, some of them uh, didn't like the nitrogen as much, um, you know, and stuff like that. So you've got some interesting genotypes here um, that were affected in various ways by the fertilizer. And again, what I was thinking here is that you've got some possible really interesting interactions between these plants and AMF in the soil. Um, and again, I wanted to pull out low variants and high variants so that we could kind of think about uh, whether and, and compare when this GWAS uh, study continues in the future when they do RNA sequencing, um, gene expression sequencing um, on these plants, on the AMF, you can really probably take a look at um, the low variance versus the high variance plants and then probably get a really interesting look at um, what exactly is happening with that AMF interaction. Um, so again, kind of talking, this is a very, this is a long study. We're in year two out of four or five. Um, so going forward, I just wanted to kind of talk about a few things that I think would be really fun to look at. Um, I will be involved with this project in the future um, after the summer. So um, these are the, some, I won't be working on everything. Um, uh, this project's divided up among multiple professors, multiple labs. Um, so, um, but I do think it'd be really cool to take a look at. Again, I did plant height as a proxy for my biomass, but you could take a look at biomass itself. Um, again, maybe compare it to height. Um, some of these plants grew really tall, but you could tell uh, others that didn't grow as tall still had a lot of biomass. Um, again, looking uh, at continuing this project, um, I will probably be involved at the look at AMF abundance in the root samples. And I think that'll be something really fun to compare to the height data that I got this summer. Um, so just, again, especially maybe some of those genotypes I pulled out, really looking at whether or not there was a lot of AMF in those um, uh, or not, and kind of just kind of being able to really kind of compare that to the variants that I was uh, looking at. Um, definitely want, would love to see some gene expression comparisons. Um, that's not an element that I'm probably going to be looking at. I think other labs are going to be focusing more on that. Um, but uh, another kind of potential thing that I didn't talk a lot about, but, you know, AMF, also helps prime, I, I briefly mentioned this at the beginning, but AMF helps prime plants um, to fight off diseases. Um, and, and I think that that is something that we can look at. We can score some of these plants for disease and then compare some of that data also to variants or treatment in the plots and get some really, really cool stuff coming out. Um, so that about wraps it up. Um, I did just want to quickly at the end here um, thank again the authors. I mentioned them at the beginning, Dr. Benenson, Dr. Davis, um, uh, Dr. Arnold, um, my mentor, Shufan. Um, and then I, uh, you know, this, uh, there's a grant for this project. Um, so I wanted to acknowledge that a lot of funding coming our way. I really appreciated it. Um, I also just wanted to give thanks to, um, some of my peers that were working in the field with me, um, in particular, Oriana, Anna, Brooke, Amelia, Cameron, um, and then, uh, again, my mentor, Shufan, 
um, and then another PhD student here, Amanda, um, all out in the field a lot with us collecting data, um, kind of sweating it out there in the Georgia heat. So I um, appreciate all of you guys. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And uh, <clears throat> we, do ha we do have a question, but I was, uh, I'm going to read it to you. Uh, do you see any value in further studying the lack of response type genotypes to understand interactions with AMF when compared to responsive genotypes? Um, you know, I, I, I really think I do because I think when you do this genome-wide study, you know, I, I think that it's it's good to look at where interactions are occurring, but I think it's equally valuable to look at where interactions aren't occurring. And the reason that I think that that's really important um, is that it's, it's, it's going to be hard to maybe tell the differences sometimes. And I think that one of the things um, that the lead PIs on this project really want to look at are being able to pull out some of these genes from plants that are also common in other crop type plants um, to be able to extend this idea about positive interactions with AMF out into other crop types. So I think that there is some uh, value even in the, the uh, genotypes that had a lack of response because again, what you're gonna be able to get with that comparison is potentially some genes um, that, that uh, maybe are there or not there um, and again, and you can kind of take those into future crops and, and really kind of focus on how this might apply outside of the exact system that we study. I'll ask uh, a question I've been dying to ask. The, uh, what was the difference between the untreated and all the treated blocks? What, 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 what did you find about height? I, my, my eyes are a little, uh, yeah, yeah, no, I, I know those graphs got a little small, uh, <laughs> the untreated plot, um, the plants grew slight, uh, a little less tall than the plots that were treated with either just nitrogen or just phosphorus. Okay. However, the plot that had both nitrogen and phosphorus, mm -hmm. uh, those plants were slightly smaller than even mm -hmm. than all three other types. So even the untreated plot was a little bit taller on average than the treated plot or than the plot that was treated by both nitrogen and phosphorus. Mm -hmm. Again, something interesting, I don't have a, a great idea about exactly why that might have occurred. Although, again, I did mention that potentially um, uh -huh. there could be a pathogenic effect there, untreated right. versus treated. Um, so uh, that's something that we definitely could look at. Okay. Um, so, uh, just on a, a, a personal note, you had so many different aspects of this project that you were involved in. What, what was your, what was your sense from that? How did you react to that? Um, you did, okay. Oh yeah. You know, I, I, I think that, uh, it was a fascinating summer because, um, when I came in, I think that I didn't fully understand the extent to which this relationship was being examined with this project. You know, I knew that it was kind of an ongoing thing, a four year thing. I knew there were going to be multiple plantings, multiple harvests. Um, but I, I didn't really kind of know how many different aspects um, were going to be looked at as far as gene expression, genotype, um, and then uh, all the stuff with the AMF too, because I was pretty involved with. Um, working on AMF abundance in the microscope prior to the summer um, or, or starting to get involved with that. And so I kind of knew that that was something that we were going to look at, um, but I didn't know that this study was just going to be so broad um, that, I, I mean, it's something that really kind of when you step back, I think that what could come out of this project are just some really amazing kind of analysis and understanding about this interaction that is, is you know, there's some stuff known about it for sure. Um, but I, I mean, the future applications of the, of the study are, are just, I mean, almost uh, endless and amazing to think about. Well, thank you so much. Um, we're gonna have a 15 minute break uh, now and that will put us uh, on the, the, the release schedule. And uh, 
So just come back. Uh, maybe uh, we'll re be back on uh, back in about 10 to 15 minutes. At 10:15. Yeah, 10:15. Yes. So uh, we're we're here. Don't go away. Stay tuned. Uh, uh, get some uh, water or coffee or whatever you need, and we'll we'll be back back with you in a few minutes. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back to the NSF and uh, REU Symposium on Genomics and Computational Biology. Uh, this is the 22nd year of, the, of this symposium. Uh, I would like to say that you can ask questions at any time uh, by just hitting the, bottom at the button at the bottom and putting your question in and we'll display those questions. Uh, at, at, at the end of the speaker's uh, presentation. And we do appreciate all the kudos that we're seeing from the speakers. Uh, I'm just uh, acknowledging those right now. And, uh, we, but questions are also good. <laughs> so I will remind you that you can do that. But you can do that at any time during the presentation. So it's my pleasure to introduce El Elizabeth Gilfiller. Gil Feather, and she is from the University of Pittsburgh. She has been working with uh, uh, Dr. Jan Mrazik, uh, graduate coordinator uh, of uh, the Institute of Bioinformatics. Uh, and she uh, is, has a wonderful project looking at the comparative genomics uh, of CS, the gene CSRA uh, that has regulatory targets and acinetobacter and related bacteria, and she will now give a presentation of her summer's findings. Welcome, uh, Elizabeth. Thank you. Um, as Dr. Arnold said, my project is the comparative genomics of CSRA regulatory targets in acinobacter bailei and related bacteria. Um, and so one goal um, that um, lab members at UGA are working on um, is a way to use bacterial metabolism to degrade some abundant carbon sources for industrial use. Um, so one thing that they're looking at is the untabbed carbon source um, lignin. Um, and one thing that they're trying to do is to manipulate bacterial metabolism in order to degrade abundant plant-derived aromatic carbon sources. Um, and the goal of that is to then create biotechnology solutions um, that can be alternatives to some environmentally harmful practices. Um, and so something that is working towards that goal is to further the understanding of bacterial metabolic regulation. Um, and so Dr. Ellen Nidal here at the University of Georgia is um, working with Acinobacter bailei as a model bacterium. Um, in order to study carbon metabolism and its regulation. Uh, mainly, this bacterium is being used because it's a um, non-pathogenic soil bacterium. It's fast growing, it's easy to genetically manipulate, and it's metabolic, metabolically diverse, um, so it does naturally degrade aromatic carbon. Um, and so, um, recent research in her lab has shown that um, the protein carbon storage regulator A, or CSRA, which is a global post-transcriptional regulator, uh, may have a role in aromatic carbon regulation, um, ar aromatic carbon metabolism regulation um, in Acinobacter bailei. Um, and so this protein works by binding to two GGA sequence motifs near the ribosomal binding site. 
and then it either represses translation by blocking the ribosomal binding site or it activates translation um, by opening up that ribosomal binding site for the ribosome to bind. Um, and so what we wanted to do is to use um, a comparative genomics approach. Um, and so we compared um, Acinobacter bailei to 14 other Acinobacter species, four Pseudomonas species, and one Sphingomonas species. Um, all of these bacteria um, reg uh, degrade aromatic compounds naturally. Um, and so what we did is we created a table um, of orthologous genes in those species um, and then used a program CSRA target in order to predict um, which of those um, orthologs are being regulated by CSRA uh, based on those um, sequence motifs. Um, and so this is an example of the orthology table. This is a small part of it. Um, in the rows, you can see that um, we have clustered the genes based on their orthologs, and then in each column is those orthologous genes in each of the species. Um, and then in green, we have marked the predicted CSRA targets. And so if we look at example for um, cat A, there's only two of these um, ortho, um, orthologs are being predicted by CSRA. Whereas in um, CAT C, there's um, multiple that are being predicted by CSRA. And so one thing that we wanted to look at is, okay, well then why are some of these um, orthologs being predicted to be regulated by CSRA in some species and not others? Um, and so we did a sequence alignment to look at that. Um, so in the um, for many of these species, it's likely that CSRA is um, able to bind and then regulate the gene in some species, but not in others. Um, um, but there are also some instances such as um, CIS-E here, where in, we look at, we can see that the first two species um, are predicted to be CSRA targets, um, and they each have two motif pairs. Whereas in the third species, those motif pairs aren't there, and so it's also not predicted to be a CSRA target. Um, the reason for this is though that a low affinity binding site is where in other species there's a high affinity binding site. Um, and so um, it's possible that CSRA is also binding and regulating this third species, just maybe to a lesser degree. Um, and so that's something that's really important is to look at multiple um, different species to get a, a broader sense of CSRA's regulatory um, power. Um, so then what we did is we looked at where are these proteins that we're studying um, being regulated in the different pathways. Um, so if we look at this pathway map here from KEG, um, we can see that each box represents a protein in the pathway, and then the color of the box represents um, the species that that protein is present in, and the outline of the box represents um, the species that we predict CSRA um, is regulating that gene in. Um, and so blue is for Acetobacter bailei, green is for other Acetobacter species, red is for Pseudomonas species, and then purple is for if it's a predicted target in Acetobacter and Pseudomonas species. Um, so looking here at pyruvate metabolism, um, this is a core part of the central carbon metabolism pathways. Um, and we can see that there are multiple genes that are predicted to be CSRA targets um, in most of these species. Um, and this is what we would expect because the primary role of CSRA is in carbon metabolism regulation. Um, and so there's, it's doing a lot of regulation here. Um, so then if we look at benzoate degradation, benzoate is an aromatic carbon source that's um, naturally metabolized in Acinobacter bailei and some other bacteria. Um, and so this pathway metabolizes benzoate into substrates that can be used in the citric acid cycle citric acid cycle. Um, and we can see that many of the genes um, predicted here are in Acinobacter species, and very few are in the Pseudomonas species. Um, particularly, these are um, concentrated here in the beta ketoadipate pathway. Um, so this pathway um, is focused on aromatic carbon degradation. Um, specifically, um, we can see that this um, is predicted to be regulated by Acinobacter bailei and other Acinobacter species. 
and there's no predicted regulation in Pseudomonas species by CSRA. Um, additionally, if we look, there's a critical step um, in which um, the aromatic ring is broken, um, and we can see that that's being regulated um, by Acinobacter bailei and some other species. That would be the um, first step, PCAG and PCAH, or um, P uh, Cat A. Um, and so that's a really important part of this pathway that is um, being regulated that we predict by CSRA. Um, so another thing we looked at were some select transporters um, and how they are being regulated by CSRA. Um, so by regulating transporters, CSRA is also able to regulate the pathways that those transported molecules act in. Um, and so we predict that CSRA is regulating some aromatic compound transporters in Acinobacter bailei and some other Acinobacter species. Um, and then in Pseudomonas species and some Acinobacter species that are pathogenic, um, we see that there's some multidrug and antibiotic transporter um, trans transporters being uh, predicted to be regulated by CSRA. Um, so another species that we did look at was Sphingomonas, um, which does also degrade aromatic compounds, but does not have CSRA. Um, and we found that it had a comparable number of predicted CSRA targets um, with the um, species that do have CSRA, which is not what we would expect. Um, so what we did is, uh, along with some other bacterial species, um, we ran simulations to simulate um, 10,000 genomes, I mean, sorry, 1,000 genomes for each of those species. Um, and then we, um, to do that, we randomized those genomes and then preserved the um, core gene the features um, in those genomes. Um, and from that, we were able to see that 22 out of the 23 um, species with CSRA had a higher number of predicted CSRA targets compared to the 95th percentile. Uh, whereas that number was only four out of nine for the species without CSRA. And so uh, we do see that there's a higher number of predicted CSRA targets than an average, um, which um, is a good sign for that our predictions are um, accurate and valid. Um, and so then we also, um, so we see that aromatic carbon metabolism and the other pathways um, are predicted to be regulated by CSRA in Acinobacter bailei and related bacteria. Um, and so these predictions can in the future be experimentally tested um, with the hopes to identify some enzymes that are regulated by CSRA that can then be used to create new aromatic compound metabolism pathways. Um, and those can be used um, for a number of uses, including um, creating industrial chemicals, breaking down plastics, um, breaking down pesticides um, for future industrial use. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank um, Dr. Young Razik, who's my project mentor, as well as Dr. Arnold, um, our program director, and I got a lot of help from Dr. Ellen Nidal's lab, um, so I'd like to thank them as well. Well, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Uh, I just want to indicate that at the bottom of the of your screen, you can uh, you can hit a little box and put a question uh, to, to Elizabeth, and uh, but I'll I'll sort of start start the questions. I was curious how many targets of CSRA uh, in some of the the uh, bacterial species you found was it? Yeah, what was how how extensive was its control of carbon metabolism? Um, sure. So it depends on the different species. We range yeah. from about um, 30 um, CS targets to about um, 300, um, just mm -hmm. depending on the different species. Uh -huh. um, however, overall, we had about 1,000 um, targets um, because, again, many of these species um, are predicted to be um, regulated in the same gene, just in different species. Uh -huh. um, but um, not all of these were um, found to be regulating carbon metabolism. Um, there's um, some other pathways um, such as like biofilm formation and motility that um, CSRA was also regulating in. Yeah. 
So yeah, one of the, the aromatic compounds I'm particularly interested in is near the beta keto adipate pathway. And I'm just wondering if it showed up. Uh, this is uh, quinic acid. It's something that's uh, a degraded compound in, 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 you know, in the, left in the soil after decay, in decaying plant material. Did quinic acid uh, metabolism show up at all under uh, CSRA? It's, uh, like I said, it's near the beta keto adipate pathway. It's a, um, I'm not entirely sure um, because we okay. did look at so many genes. Um, right. I, I didn't get a chance to look at each one individually, but um, right. I can definitely look into it and get back to you. Yeah, that would be very because I do know that um, the one of the genes uh, in the QA gene cluster is found in bacterial species and actually was. Uh, the capitalized on, but by fortuitously when it was cloned into E. coli, it actually worked. That which is you know unusual that you could just take a eukaryotic gene and a fungus and put it into a bacteria. But it's something. It's it is a gene that's involved in uh, uh, quinic acid metabolism in bacterial species. So I was curious. Do you have any sense of how how much you might say this CSGRA network in these different species was changing? How dynamic, you know, just from your inferences, you might look at one species that you you lose a bunch of genes that were in found. And did you get a sense of how dynamic the network that might be under the control of CSGRA is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when we were um, looking, there was not many genes that were um, we were predicting to be regulated by CSRA across all of the species. Uh -huh. um, however, um, there were like groups of species that were very similarly um, regulated by CSRA. Uh -huh. um, and so uh, that could be something to be looked into as well as um, yeah. which species have similar regulation profiles. Uh, right. Yeah. So, um that again, on the uh, personal side, how did, uh, where is this project going to be taking you next year? What, uh, what are your, your thoughts for the future? Yeah, well, um, with this project, I think um, that Dr. Ellen Nidal's lab is um, really excited about it because they can um, be potentially using some of these predictions okay. to um, further their work with, um, finding metabolism uh -huh. pathways that they can uh -huh. use to degrade um, different aromatic compounds. Uh -huh. um, as far as for me personally, um, I, and I, I'll continue with my undergraduate education, uh -huh. but um, I will be keeping in touch to um, uh -huh. help along with the project in whatever way I right. can, yeah. Okay, I have a question for you in the audience. Uh, qu quinate IS, CSRA regulated in ADP1 via its intermediate PCA and via transport. Oh, that's more of a comment. So <laughs> I guess someone has been busy at work uh, on this question. So that's a really neat connection because uh, part of the beginnings of genetics uh, here at the University of Georgia was in the study of quinate metabolism. So you're coming back, you're returning to the roots of UGA by studying this mm -hmm. problem. So thank you very much. And I will now introduce our next speaker, um, <clears throat> which is Alexia Innes. And Hello. she is also a reflection of the partnership uh, of UGA with Clark Atlanta University. Uh, she's uh, uh, working with Travis uh, Glenn, uh, who is the director of the Institute of Bioinformatics. And uh, we're going to continue this uh, theme of antimicrobials and, and good things and bad things <laughs> that <laughs> bacteria and microbes do. And so it's my pleasure to introduce her and she'll be talking about E. coli and antimicrobials 
microbial resistance genes. Welcome, Alexia. Hello, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Dr. Arnold, for introducing me. Just to reiterate, my name is Alexia Innes, and I'm a rising junior biology major at Clark Atlanta University. Today, I'll be discussing E. coli and antimicrobial genes under the advisement of the Glenn Lab. Just to provide a quick overview of my presentation, here are some of the things I will be discussing during my time, and there will be some closing acknowledgments. What is antimicrobial resistance? Antimicrobial resistance occurs when bacteria, parasites, um, viruses, and fungi mutate over time and build a tolerance to no longer respond to standard treatments. This has been linked to misuses and overuse of antibiotics. It is important that we study antimicrobial resistance for human and public health. According to the World Health Organization, antimicrobial resistance is one of the top 10 global health threats to humanity. If resistance it to antibiotics, antibiotics is developed, it makes it much harder than it already is to treat illnesses. This causes, um, this causes disease spread and severity to certain illnesses and an increase of deaths due to antimicrobial resistance. It is important to study antimicrobial resistance and to, to, find, to res find solutions to prevent and resolve this issue from occurring. Finding, characterizing, and monitoring reserves for anti antimicrobial resistance, AMR, is vital to protecting public health. What is ESBL? Extended spectrum beta lactamase are enzymes produced by certain bacteria that may make them resistant to some antibiotics. These bacteria are most commonly found in the digestive system and are resistant to second and third generation cephalosporins. Due to this, antibiotics become resistant and ineffective against bacteria. Antimicrobial resistant genes, or ARGs, are mobile genetic elements that can pass between microorganisms via horizontal, horizontal gene transfer, even from dead to living cells. Keeping pace when, dis when discovering ARGs is a challenge because when studying antimicrobial resistance, um, novel ARGs are continuously being identified. What is Oxford nano nanopore sequencing? Slow cells contain tiny holes that go to nanopores and electro electrical system membranes. Each nanopore corresponds with elect electric currents connected to its channel and a sensor chip, which measures um, the electro ele electric current that flows through the nanopore. When a molecule passes through a, a nanopore, the current is disrupted to produce a characteristic squiggle. The squiggle is then decided using base code al algorithms to determine the DNA or R RNA sequencing in real time. To summarize, monitors changes to an electro electrical currents as nucle nucle nucleic acids are passed through a protein in a pore. Um, the power of long reads. Um, broadly, this is where like um, the data is collected and this is how we um, extended the DNAs that we collected. Um, fecal matter were collected from human and then anti antibiotic resistant genes were grown on a plate and isolated for ESBLs. DNA is extracted and on an ONT library is prepared and on a sequence an OIT min ion is collected. This then, um, to conclude the process, is then sent to bioinformatics for data analysis. Here is just a bioinformatic pipeline of how these reads work and what's the next steps after collection of the data. So raw reads are downloaded and are trimmed and filtered for quality. Next genome assembly takes place and ARGs are identified to conclude. And to conclude, data analysis occurs. What is AMR finder? AMR Finder began development by NSBI in 2018 and it was software used to identify AMR genes, resistant associated point mutations, and select other classes of genes using protein annotations and or assembly, assembled nucleotide sequences. This is an actual screen grab of an AMR Finder output. It may look overwhelming at first, but in there it provides the length of the contents in your sample that was RAM, bacteria classes in your sample, and much more information results. How well did our sequencing 
work within our sample. Our sample of our sequencing were performed properly and yielded results to match. This is due to the quality control and the standards that we established within AMR Finder. Um, specific qualifications were put into AMR Finder to filter and ensure div diverse yet consistent data in our study. The length of the contents in the sample can be used to determine quality control in our data. In these figures, you can see the length of the contents are consistent and around the same length. This was something that was observed in a vast majority amount of the samples in, of the DNA that we collected in the Glenn lab. Here is just the number of R kits. And um, in this figure, um, quinolone and efflux were the most detected in ARGs in our samples, and this was a common theme in most of the data collected. Here is um, a comparison of our lab strain of E. coli to the ESBLs that were collected. And where you see overlap is where our strain and our lab strain are identical and they show the same characteristics. This was also observed in many other of, this, of the samples that were collected. In conclusion, it was um, it's important to show diligence and include an inclusivity in um, relation to data collection and accuracy for public health. Because if you are not collecting from a certain group of people, if you're leaving them out, it makes the data skewed and it doesn't um, relate to everyone, especially when it comes to public health. Um, Diligence regarding antimicrobial resistance. We cannot overuse antibiotics because then, like I stated previously, it would be cause a public health um, scare, yes. And the importance of bioinformatics in maintaining public health. Without bioinformatics, none of this information would be available and we would not know what's next. And bioinformatics helps provide a guideline and shows data and stats of what actually is happening behind the scenes. There's some references. And to conclude, I would just like to send a big thank you to Dr. Travis Glenn, Dr. Jonathan Arnold, Megan Baldry, postdoctoral associate, Katie Dillon, doctoral student, Fifi Agabang Dazi, doctoral student, everybody else at the entire Glenn Lab that helped me with my matriculation through the RE program. Thank you. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. Uh, you know, this is a very important problem because we were running out of antibiotics so um i was curious where how where did the samples actually come from were they, they okay. from all over the world or no you know, so actually 500 samples were collected in the city of athens and they oh. sent out like an email like send your fecal matter and we'll send you this so 500 people return back uh -huh. with their fecal matter, which is a lot. <laughs> so then uh -huh. after that, the study took place and yeah. Uh-huh. Yes. And so do you, do you think, are there plans to, to sample outside the U.S. as part of this study or? I'm not uh, entirely sure, but I think uh -huh. that would be an amazing idea because this is not yeah. just the Athens, Georgia problem. This is the whole right. entire world problem. So. Right. And I, again, I can just remind the audience, there's a little button at the bottom of your screen. You can just type in your, your questions. And uh, the, uh, the other thing I was, I was sort of curious about is to what extent, when you looked at the, the different species that you had, had sequenced, uh, how, how frequent did you find cases of horizontal gene transfer of these resistance genes. Could you make in any inference almost, on that? In almost every single sample, there was a case of that, which is very odd. Yeah, uh huh? Yes. Wow. So it's very, very frequent. And um, so um, the the other thing that I, I've, uh, you know, does present a problem, we, we, we may have with varying degrees of success uh, be uh, limiting uses of antibiotics in people, but w what about, you know, uh, domesticated animals? They're probably much more uh, 
it, it's very, very prevalent. You can get a lot of runoff yes. in agriculture. I, I actually yeah. have a, a figure in here that um, is exactly uh -huh. what you're talking about here. Yeah. So the water treatment plant, and then it affects the water that we eat, and then it affects the plants that we eat, the food that we eat. And right. then once we eat those antibiotics, we're becoming unconsciously it's like we're becoming resistant to antibiotics because of the food that we're eating and the water, the water runoff. Right. And so we do have a question from the audience, and I'll read it to you. It's probably on your screen. How precise is nanopore sequencing compared to other second generation sequencing methods? Um, to answer that question, I would say that. Um, how precise is nanopore sequencing comparing to other second generation sequencers? Right. I would say that it's pretty precise. It holds up and uh -huh. um, it's we put we have to put in the information to make sure that the quality is uh -huh. there. So if mm -hmm. the quality is there in the first generation, it will transfer over to the second uh -huh. generation. But you, the idea, I guess, I'll just follow up on that question that the audience asked is you're focused on these long read sequencing methods, but your goal is just to ask the question whether there's a anti antimicrobial resistance gene that's present in that genome. So do you, you're probably, that's your goal, right? If yes. you either want to find it or not find it, is that right? Yes. Yeah, so even if it was a little less precise than others, uh, sequencing platforms, it really wouldn't matter as long as you could, because how big, uh, how big are these um, uh, AMR genes that you pull out? They, they're probably a couple, are they, yeah, how, how large are they? It was about, um, so for every single sample, there were about 30 to 35 um, contents, and there were about, uh -huh. probably about like 50 samples, so yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, so, yeah. but you you would have varying numbers of the antimicrobial resistance genes being pulled out this way in a particular yes. sample. But you were saying that thirty to fifty of the three hundred you found found them, basically. Yes, like in almost every single one of the samples. Yeah. Oh, every one. Okay, almost yes. every single one had them. Okay, okay, that is that's neat. Okay. Um, and so thank you so much and uh, uh, what a wonderful project. Thank and, you. And thank you for continuing our long partnership with your home institution of Clark Atlanta. <laughs> okay, so our next speaker uh, is Amelia Falman. Uh, she's uh, she's going to be talking about, uh, she's also going to be talking about pathogens, but a different kind of pathogen, fungal pathogens, and it's not on us, but it's on things we care about, like plants. And uh, she's uh, from Mount Holyoke, uh, by, by way of uh, Puerto Rico, and she's actually going to be uh, she's put together uh, two projects which are interrelated, and she's going to look at uh, canopy dry weight and its relation to pathogens present as indicators of sorghum health. And uh, remember, you can type in your questions anytime during her talk. And I, I, welcome, welcome, uh, Amelia. So, um, hi everyone. Thank you, Dr. Arnold, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, my name is Amelia Fallman, and today I will be talking about how canopy dry weight and pathogen presence can be indicators of sorghum bicolor health. So, firstly and foremost, what is sorghum? Sorghum is a grass that is part of the uh, saccharin genus. It is related to two um, very common crops, um, both uh, sugarcane and maize. It is commonly used in food production with sweet, clump, sweet sorghum being found in some syrups. It is also used for livestock um, as well as even biofuel. There's been some research going on to see which types of genes we can promote to increase the production of biofuel from sorghum. 
Another cool thing about sorghum is that it's extremely sturdy and drought resistant. So um, for, for this reason, it grows a lot in a lot of more warmer temperatures that might have inconsistent rain because it can really stand through these harsh environments. Like several other plants, sorghum can have a symbiotic relationship with AMF. So what is AMF? AMF or arbuscular micro mycorrhizal fungi, as the name suggests, is the fungi, but not that type of fungi. It is more sort of like this. It is microscopic and it works, um, it interacts with um, several different plant species. AMF is found in about 80% of terrestrial plants and it is the most widespread symbi terrestrial symbiotic uh, fungi, which is really cool. Despite being so common, it is actually completely reliant on its host species for survival. And so you may be wondering if it's completely reliant for its host species, why is the plant still choosing to like, still having like this relationship with it? Um, so one of the major benefits that plants receive from having the symbiotic relationship with um, AMF is that they are able to gain resources from it. After the AMF has attached itself onto the roots, the, um, the AMF itself will spread further down to where the roots would normally be able to go and it can get several different nutrients. So as the plant is getting a lot of nutrients from the air, such as CO2 and getting nutrients from the light above, AMF is going deep down the roots and getting nutrients such as carbon, um, such as nitrogen and phosphorus that the plants might not otherwise have been able to get. This has really helped um, a lot of terrestrial land plants actually get access to, root, to um, nutrients in the soil before um, we had like several million thousand years before we had like a lot of common land plants. Now, if AMF can benefit a plant's health, then it would be interesting to know how different strains of sorghum can respond to AMF. So first I wanted to see how we could figure out a measurement for um, health um, using the dry weight. We started our experiment by comparing both root dry weight and canopy dry weight. Um, since we had both data points, we wanted to see if we could use only one for our linear model or if we were going to use both. As you can tell from this um, layered bar plot, they seem to kind of correlate, but um, we decided to use some uh, linear regression to see if they actually do. And so looking into um, alien regression, you can see that they actually correlate really well. Um, so to me, I made a um, scatter plot using both variables, normalizing both the root dry weight and the kind of dry weight. I, do find, I found that they do in fact correlate with each other, having an R squared of zero, um, 0.73. This is really awesome. It means that we can use only one as our dependent variable. And so um, because canopy dry weight had a lot more data points, I ended up choosing to use that one instead. Um, the next thing I did was to make a linear model. And so for my linear model, I had to take several different variables present that could affect the way we found how canopy dry weight was found. Um, this included the um, harvest group. So we had harvest groups one, two, and three, as well as the two different um, uh, stages, which were used as my fixed variables. And for my random variables, I had the 79 accessions and the three different blocks. Um, real quick in the beginning of my of making this linear model, I found that um, the stages actually had a lot of data that um, um, was incomplete. So I actually couldn't use this. That one's taken off from the linear model real quick. And then after some analysis, I found that um, the blocks had no effect on how much the canopy dry weight varied. So I removed it as well. Our final model ended up being um, the log of canopy dry weight um, with a dependent variable of harvest group as a fixed variable, as well as accessions as our random variable. And really interestingly, we also had their interaction. So it seems that not only is the harvest group affecting how what the canopy dry weight is going to end up being, but also that the specific accession will affect how it shows up in each harvest, which is really cool data to have. Um, you can really see this, um, the way the accession varies in this next graph. Um, clearly, there is definitely a difference between how much each different strain of, of, of sorghum or each different accession um, and how much, how much canopy dry weight it is um, able to collect from it. Um, into looking to how the harvest is going, you can see even more variation here. You have like harvest one, two, and three, and how the different accessions vary on top of being 
um, varying dependently on um, how the harvest is actually varying based on the accession. It's really, really cool. So next, um, let's talk about diseases. So AMF, as mentioned previously, is known for helping um, a plant's health, but it can actually also help in pathogen resistance. And this is really, really cool, um, as it means that the relationship they have in AMF um, could actually help a plant be able to resist different types of pathogens. So what diseases do we look into? So we started, originally I was going to look into seven different diseases. Um, however, two of those ended up being a uh, false smut and air gut, and those are only found in the panicles, which is when the sorghum starts flowering. Because the plants we had are um, planted actually weren't at that stage yet, I ended up not looking into those. And then interestingly, I didn't actually find any anthracnose while I was doing my research. So instead we were left with four different diseases that I looked into, including leaf blight, certain leaf spot, gray leaf spot, and target leaf spot. And here's some really quick overview pictures, but to really get into the nitty gritty of the symptoms of these diseases, we can look into um, more close-ups of this. Um, and so leaf blight actually tends to show up as a sort of brown decay that kind of kills the leaf, come from the outside. We had so many leaf spot, which starts out as some, some like smaller cycle blocks, and then as it grows and increases, creates a sort of ring layered effect, which is really cool. Gray leaf spot um, starts off as like Similar to Sony, so some black spots. However, these sort of expand and have these gray, like grayish lines in the middle, which is um, really neat. And then the target leaf spot has like these red specklings. And so it would show up maybe as like a stripe in the middle or a few specklings here and there. And then it would slowly overtake the entire plant. And so how did we collect this data? So this is a rough outline of our um, plots. All of these plots actually have been previously colonized by AMF. And so you can see that we have plot A, B, and C, very similar, as well as several different rows. And this is, um, in this, um, we would score each individual disease in the plant if we found it would scale from one to nine. And if it didn't have any diseases, it got a default of zero, which is called resistant. Um, here we can see the sum of like all of the diseases throughout. So you can tell there's like plot A seems to have quite a few diseases, which is really interesting. And then if you look at the next week, ooh, if you look at the next week, you can see that it's really increasing. And then further on in between weeks two and three, um, it actually rained, which was really interesting because that is the main way that these pathogens spread. It's through runoff. And so we found there was a huge increase between weeks two and three about the amount of diseases. And then it was just raining for the rest of the time. And then all of a sudden we go to week four and wow, has it really taken over? This was really cool knowledge. And so I was like, oh, wow, there was so many pathogens, but it'd be really interesting to know which specific types of pathogens are actually affecting or spreading. And so if we started looking into individual diseases, and so here we have, um, we have leaf blight and um, target leaf spot as well as green leaf spot and sony. And you can see that first week, very simple, very similar to the first one, just a few spread here and there. And then your second one, about the same, um, not much changing. And then all of a sudden you go to the third week when it was raining, you're like, oh wow, it's really spreading. It's like, you can really see there's an increase between target leaf spot as well as leaf blight. And going back to the fourth week, you see that the two main diseases are target leaf spot and leaf blight, which means that while in the overall disease score, it looks like there was a, a huge spread of disease, the two main culprits here were, um, target leaf spotting leaf blight, you can really see when you're out in the field. It's um, incredible how quickly it spreads like sort of overnight. And so this was a uh, really neat to see. Um, for, because this is just preliminary data for future studies, I actually made a really rough model of what a disease scoring would be like. And so I had what would be my disease score. So the rating between um, one to uh, nine for each individual disease um, and then adding those all up together. And then that varied by the observation date, which was the date we went in, the other week one, two, three, or four. It also varied by a session, which was really cool. Visually, I got to see it there, that if you had a disease in one specific session, you normally had it in every single plant in that session. So it was great to see that the, the first model I made actually confirmed this. Um, we also had block, which was really cool because it means that it's very likely that the block that a, every specific disease is in can actually affect the way it is being spread. Um, my, current hypothesis for this is because it's kind of on a slightly hill. So you notice in the beginning that um, block A had a lot more disease than block C. And I believe that this is because it is sort of running down. So as the water runs down, the diseases could have spread down because of the runoff. Um, and then we also had that there was um, an interaction between all of these different things, which meant that like 
the block could be also like the way the block reacted could be based on like the way the harvest day, uh, the data assertion day was. Maybe like the accession would be different, shown differently depending on the block. And it was, it's really interesting to see how these different things interact. There's definitely, it's a very rough model and it needs a lot more confirmation to see if we can make it simpler. Um, but it was still cool to see how these many different things are reacting to one another and interacting and could really show the spread of the seas. Um, on top of that, uh, for futures, we'd really like to, be, um, to see whether the accessions that did really great with the canopy dry weight, like the ones who had the most canopy dry weight, who, which could be seen as a, um, a proxy to health, correlate with the um, accessions that actually resisted to the most amount of diseases. That way you could see like, oh, these two, these types of strains are resistant, are able to not only prosper, as well as able to um, resist disease. This would make sense as it's been seen that um, certain plants, once they receive um, or have a, are hosting a disease, actually tend to have a harder time growing. So it'd be really great to see if this actually correlate with one another. Um, I believe they do, and I would love to see whether they do in the future. Um, something else is also adding a new disease. So I mentioned before that I actually didn't find antichronous between harvest one, two, between um, date observation one, two, three, and four. Um, however, that does not mean that anthracnose isn't present. Personally, um, when I was back there last uh, last Monday, I actually went to check it out and I was like, I found this um, phenotype of this disease. And I was like, wow, I've never seen this before. And it's, I'm pretty sure it's anthracnose, which means that there could be more diseases showing up that I just haven't seen. It'd be great to continue keeping note to see what differences maybe show up later in the harvest or later on in the observation days, which ones are like first colonizing. And something that we didn't take into account, and I definitely didn't take this into account, is um, white flies. So, um, White flies are these um, aphids that actually attach itself to the plant and like sort of drain out the nutrients. And it has been known that white flies are actually attracted to plants that are already diseased. It is much easier for them to actually take out the nutrients from these sorts of plants. Um, and so because of this, whenever there was an area that had like, a lot of targets or like had a lot of like these little like release spots, for some reason, for, I, I found it observationally to be found a lot in correlation with targets, you would have these giant amounts of like aphids covering the plants and the bottom plant, especially in the diseased areas, which would attract many other insects because these aphids produce um, some sort of sweet nectar, like that they that um, bring in wasps and hornets and bees. Um, so it was really interesting to see how these two things, and so whether or not a plant could be suffering from having both the aphids basically taking out all these nutrients, as well as having already sick from disease. Um, so it was really wonderful to see like this sort of interaction. And so hopefully for future studies, we can see that like, whether or not these white flies actually have um, effects on the, on the plants themselves. All right. Um, and then the final thing we looked into is whether the weather effects on the disease score slash spread. So, um, as I mentioned before, diseases are spread by runoff, which means that depending on the specific weather of the time, you find more disease. In the very first couple of weeks that I was doing my observation, there's actually some points where we watered by watering can, which really reduces the amount of runoff there is because you're like very carefully watering like near the roots, there's no like spread, um, which is a lot less likelihood for spread than even irrigation, as irrigation kind of mimics rain where it's just like watering down and you can see the, the pathogens sort of running off a little bit. However, when you have heavy rains like we did at the very end, like between three and four, you can really see how quickly those pathogens spread. It's very much like an over, it feels like an overnight thing where all of a sudden there is like target in like one area and all of a sudden it spreads to be all over the plot. And so they'd be really interesting to see how the um, weather data could actually um, affect the amount of pathogens found on the field as well as the spread of pathogens. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge my mentors, uh, Shu Fan Shuang, um, Amanda Buffer Langram, and Dr. Bakra, um, as well as my PI, Dr. Arnold, um, as well as the um, NSF for like the grant influencing for this. I really, um, I really appreciate all of this. So yeah, thank you. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the the wonderful, wonderful presentations uh, presentation. I was uh, I like the idea of you're trying to predict the 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 scoring for disease, you know, as your dependent variable in your regression. Did did you are you thinking about including the score actually as an independent variable on 
in predicting log dry weight. Have you thought about that down just linking directly the two parts of your 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 research? Surprisingly, I'd actually not consider that, but it would make uh, would make a lot of sense considering uh -huh. how plants can depend their canopy dry weight based on the disease scoring. Uh -huh. So that would be something that we could probably add into the model, especially right. once we get more data from this specific harvest time as the, the data from the previous um, harvest time is actually from last year. So we cannot uh -huh. really correlate it with the diseases from this year. But with the data we get from the, this, from the canopy driver from this year, we could probably actually correlate those really well. Mm -hmm. That sounds great. Yeah, so that's something we can look forward to. And then the, the other thing that came to mind, uh, I was tr trying to look at the the maps of the spread of the diseases. Can you say something about uh, how many how many diseases did an individual plant support uh, have to deal with, or was it like genotype, you know, accession specific? Which ones were getting hit by the different leaf leaf blights? So I would actually say it's both. So the most okay. amount of diseases I found on a single plant were three and okay. never above like a rating of either one or two. So if you had like maybe uh -huh. you had a rating of two for leaf blight, but then you had like uh -huh. some spotting that looked like a leaf spot and then like, oh, uh -huh. this looks like a ring for zoni. And so it was very much like I never above like a rating for one to two for any of them. So the max would probably uh -huh. three. Um, but I also would say that these diseases spread, I feel very much accession based because uh -huh. like if you saw one accession that had three different diseases, like while well, planning that session, probably the rest of them would also probably have that disease or those uh -huh. diseases. And so similarly, you see like, oh, this plant has like leaf blight and target. Well, it's uh -huh. very, very likely that the rest of the plants with the session. We'd really have to do some more um, actual statistical analysis to prove this. But for uh -huh. now, from observational data, definitely, I, I think that a session is a very, very much so varying what types of diseases a plant is resistant to are getting. Yeah. So what you're saying is once you saw oh, the plants, the accessions or genotypes are planted each in their own row, that once you saw one plant succumb to that particular pathogen, the, the sort of the whole row, row succumbed pretty quickly. Is that, is that a good summation? That is an excellent summation. You can kind okay. of see it if you look into the, you can see like right. some of the really like, it's like a row has like a certain color of disease. Right, right. Okay. Oh, well, this is wonderful. And, and thank you so much. And uh, I, a, a wonderful presentation. I thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it's, uh, my pleasure, we're going to actually continue looking at uh, uh, plants, but we're going to shift in AMF, but we're going to shift uh, to the pole bean uh, instead. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Tiffany James. We've had also a long, as well as having a longstanding partnership with Clark Atlanta University, we've had an equally longstanding partnership with Fort Valley State University. And uh, th that is where Tiffany comes from. So I'm very happy to see that partnership continuing right down to the present. So she's gonna talk about AMF fungi and the association with root or architecture. Welcome, Tiffany. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Arnold. So good morning, everybody. My name is Tiffany James and like Dr. Arnold said, I attend Fort Valley State University majoring in plant science biotechnology. So today I will be talking to you guys about a project I had the pleasure to work on this summer with Dr. Alexander Bush and his grad students at University of Georgia. So this summer we studied our muscular mycorrhizal fungi, also known as AMF, and its role and association with root architecture type, AT, in the common bean Phaseolus vulgaris. So for some background, our muscular mycorrhizal fungi, they are soil-borne microorganisms that form mutualistic symbiotic relationships with many terrestrial plants. And AMF is known to strongly modulate root architecture type, but how 
it does it is still undetermined. And the term architecture includes two important aspects of the root system. It includes its shape and its structure. Root architectures, they are associated with improved plant growth, nutrient uptake characteristics, and plant development. And there are currently four known architecture types and AMF's relation with certain root architecture types in the common bean, Phaseolus vulgaris, is currently unknown. So our objective was to determine if AMF has a direct relation on root architecture type in the common bean. And here is an actual microscopic image that I took of a root tip that includes, as you can see, lots of AMF in it. And right next to it are the four different root architecture types that are currently known. So for our method, 80 seeds of the common bean with the genotype DOR364, they were planted in a stress-free, well-watered environment in the UGA botany greenhouse. And we let them germinate over the period of four weeks. And after extracting the root, we cut off the shoot. We cleaned the roots in a water bath. We then took images of the root to determine architecture type. We cut the root tip of the primary and lateral roots, and we placed the roots, root tips in a 70% isopropyl alcohol solution. And five microscopy images were then taken of each root tip sample to identify the quantity of root hairs and fungi on each sample, on each plant sample. And the sample was observed using a wet mount technique. So I got a slide, I put the root tip sample on the slide, saturated it in H2O and put a cover slip on top. And then I put it underneath the microscope to observe it. And then we created five different classifications to group each sample into. And those five classifications were only fungi with minimal root hairs. So this classification had about 98 to 99% fungi with one to 2% root hairs. And the next classification was only root hairs with minimal fungi. So this classification had about 98 to 99% root hairs and only one to 2% fungi. The next one was equal distribution of root hairs and fungi, or AMF, and this had about 50% root hairs and 50% AMF. The next classification was predominantly fungi, and this classification had about 75% fungi and about 25% root hairs. And the last class that we had was predominantly root hairs, and this class had about 75% root hairs with about 25% AMF on the sample. And we created these five classes in hopes of grouping each class with an architecture type, since there are four architecture types, and having one outlier. And then um, we made histograms and sorted them by the percentage of each architecture type and each classification. So here are the first two um, graphs that we have. So the first one is predominantly root hairs, which like I said, is about 75% root hairs with about 25% AMF. And as you can see, architecture type one and architecture type two, they both had 0% of their plant samples in this class. And architecture type three had 8% and architecture type four had, sorry, Architecture type four had about 13%. Sorry, I can't really read it. And the next graph that we had was only root hairs with minimal fungi. And once again, architecture type one had 0% of the plant samples in this class. And once again, only root hairs, minimal fungi, this class has about 98 to 99% root hairs with about one to 2% AMF on the sample. Architecture type two had 17% of the plant samples in this classification. Architecture type three had eight and architecture type four had 13%. And these are the last three graphs that we 
had. So the next one is equal distribution of root hairs and fungi. So this one had about 50% root hairs and 50% AMF on the sample. Architecture type one had 40% of their plant samples in this class. AT2, 17%, AT3 had 15%, and AT4 had 0% of their plant samples in this class. Next one, only fungi with minimal root hairs. So this one is about 98 to 99% AMF on the sample with about 1 to 2% root hairs. So AT1 had 40% of their plant samples in this class, AT2, 50%, AT3, 23%, and AT4 had 63% of their plant samples in this class. And the last graph that we have is predominantly fungi, and this, one, this class is about 75% AMF with about 25% root hairs. So AT1 had 20% of their plant samples in this class, AT2, 17%, AT3, 46%, and AT4 had 19%. So the analysis that I made was that the histograms reveal that architecture type one, architecture type three, and architecture type four, they are most likely to form relationships with AMF. And this study is only a starting point to access the relationship between AMF attachment preferences and root architecture types. And more studies will have to be done in order to get a better analysis. And below, I attached pictures of the architecture type with a microscopy image that related to that sample and as you can see architecture type 2 um they had architect type 2 had a lot more root hairs on the sample versus architect type 1 3 and 4 they had a lot more fungi Hi. I, so, thank you so much, Tiffany. Oh, I had a couple more slides. Oh, you Sorry. did? Okay, good. Yeah. That's what I wanted to make sure. Please go yeah. ahead. <laughs> <laughs> So um, some future directions that I would recommend that they um, my uh, group takes would be to attempt different stress environments to detect if stress, stress environments have an influence on AMF and to also let the plants germinate for a longer period of time because we only let the plants germinate for four weeks but who knows what difference it can make if we let them germinate for a month, two months, three months and so on. I also recommend to complete the experiment on a larger scale to get a better idea and to calculate the nutrients in the plant samples to determine if AMF quantity affects nutrient acquisition. And these are my references. I would like to thank NSF and University of Georgia and Dr. Jonathan Arnold and my mentor, Dr. Alex Bush, for letting me work on this pro project. Thank you for the wonderful talk. And I uh, was, it, it's uh, really neat looking at these root architectures and trying to relate it to AMF colonization. I was uh, curious that um, whether was the, uh, to create the initial classification of the, the root architectures, uh, what went into that? It, it, was it just simply, you know, you know, presence, absence of root hairs or presence, absence of AMF, or was it based on additional features of the root system that this classification system you were using? So first we looked at all the pictures as a whole, and uh -huh. then we, I set some requirements for each classification like uh -huh. I took five different image samples to refer uh -huh. each classification to um, uh -huh. because, and I wrote down the characteristics of root hairs versus the characteristics of fungi. So I would okay. be able to sort each image into each class. Okay. Okay. 
I, I, um, I'm going to encourage people to just put questions in the chat. The, there's a button at the bottom and uh, it's easy to do. Um, so the other thing I was wondering about, you, you probably picked the pole bean because the root system, you get a nice clean root morphology out of it in the lab. And, and I, so I was wondering, did you end up, uh, what was it, s s did you end up ever running those root images through DIRT, the program, Alex's program for characterizing root morphology and looking at some of the, the characteristics of those root morphologies like diameter and bushiness and things like that? Uh, yes, we did run the images through DIRT, but we didn't really use a lot of the information from it yeah. for uh, this specific project. Okay. But the reason I ask is the speaker after you is also, I think, is also going to be looking at DIRT. But the interesting thing to me is what if you base the classification system that you generate generated what if you based it on the the dirt output so you get you know you might get 30 30 different measures of what the root looks like and i'm just curious if that could be actually used to create the classification system so any thoughts on that um, I think it possibly could in the future uh -huh. be used to um, uh -huh. because there are a lot of there's a lot of data that's given on dirt, but I just happen right. to just do it based off of just eyesight right. and just looking and picking it out. But I think right. dirt could possibly help. Uh huh. Yeah, this is this is fascinating. And so I, your story is going to continue. Uh, but it's, uh, we're going to take a, a small break, uh, and again, we'll resume at, at 1130 and we'll be looking at dirt again, uh, but just a different organism. And, uh, I want to thank you very much for a, a wonderful presentation and, uh, come back to us in, at 1130 and, uh, I'll, I'll see you at 11.30, everyone. Okay.
Welcome to the 22nd year of the NSF REU Symposium on Genomics and Computational Biology with support from the Department of Energy. Uh, it's my pleasure to continue the story uh, on the examin examination of root morphology. We just finished with the speaker, uh, Tiffany James, looking at the root morphology of the common pole, uh, pole bean. And now Brooke Lincoln will take a look at a different organism, sorghum, uh, and do an analysis of root morphology uh, from, uh, or, uh, from plants that were, were collected in the field. And this work is uh, mentored by Isaac Torres and Xufan Zhang. And I'm so grateful to have Brooke talking about this project. Welcome, Brooke. Thank you, Dr. Arnold. Um, hey, everyone. I'm going to be presenting a root morphology analysis done on sorghum bicolor. Um, I did use dirt, which was mentioned in the last um, talk. And I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about sorghum and why we find it uh, an important crop to study. Um, it is a cereal grain. And um, that means it falls into the same category or family as corn and wheat, as well as other uh, grasses. And um, it does have a pretty wide variety of uses, um, anywhere from animal feed to supporting our own diets. And it can also be used for energy. Um, it's pretty diverse. It has um, 390 different accessions from the Bioenergy Association panel. So we can use these accessions uh, to study. And it is the fifth most important cereal crop in the world. This is due to its ability to adapt to its environments. And um, it's pretty sturdy, drought tolerant. Um, and so as we have an increased need for these cereal crops, we're also trying to be more sustainable in our farming techniques. So this means uh, decreasing our fertilizer use as well as irrigation. Um, and so the question really is, how can we do this and still maintain a high yield of these crops? Uh, that's where we're going to start looking at our buscular mycorrhizal fungi. Um, it does have the potential to increase the crop yield. It's present in the vast majority of land plants, and it's forming a symbiotic relationship to the plant or with the plant. Um, so it provides nutrients such as phosphorus and nitrogen in return for carbon. And it can provide this nutrients by extending these hyphal networks down into the soil uh, past where the roots can normally get to down in the nutrient depletion zone and um, gather up that nutrients and send it back to the roots for the plant to use. So the overall goal of this project really would be to really understand the mechanism behind uh, this relationship and identify the genes that are associated with this positive AMF contribution. Um, one thing that we are looking at throughout the study is canopy dry weight. This is a good indicator of health. And it does have a direct relationship to uh, the accession. So we can ask what about these accessions are really allowing for an increase in biomass. And one thing might be um, the AMF colonization. So looking at how that um, the AMF colonization throughout is uh, um, might be different in certain accessions um, to help increase the biomass. And so my part of the study was to look at the root morphology. This might be another thing that um, allows for a higher canopy dry weight. And it might also be associated with AMF. And so the more AMF that's in the plant, the more nutrients uh, the plant is getting, allowing for bigger roots and ultimately um, more mass of the plant. So to do this study, I used DIRT. It's a digital imaging of root traits, uh, allowing for a high throughput phenotype. Um, and so it's pretty easy to use. You just take a picture of our um, samples and it will compute 78 uh, traits for us. In my study, I was only looking at 33 traits because sorghum is a monocot and some of the other traits relate to dicots. Um, and then I'm also using 99 images from our second harvest in 2021 um, that would include 33 accessions um, Vary, with varying numbers of replicates from one to six. Uh, this is just all the images that are being produced from DIRT to allow for the computation 
um, to happen. The image in the top left corner is uh, the image that we took and put into DIRT. It will then create the image on the top right. And from there, it creates a better image um, on the bottom left and then the skeletal version of this image. Um, here is just an overview of all the traits that I chose to um, look at in the analysis. I'm gonna briefly describe a few that aren't as self-explanatory, um, such as the spatial root distribution of X and Y. So it's gonna take the bounding box around the root, um, pick the center, uh, the center point, and then from there, where is the center of mass? So in relation to center mass to the center of the bounding box on both the X and Y axis. Um, and then, also root top angle and root bottom angle. The top angle is looking at a 90 or a 10% depth up to the soil line, what's the angle there? And then again, it's doing the same thing for the root bottom angle, but it's um, looking at a 90% depth. So here is just a distribution of all the traits. Um, you can see a lot of them are pretty normally distributed, but some of them are um, skewed a little bit more to the right. Um, I think this does makes sense with our data as biomass and height data that we've received from the plants um, are also a little bit more right skewed. So it kind of makes sense that you're going to have a bigger um, and wider root system within those plants. Um, now I'm going to go into an ANOVA. Um, it's basically a way of testing the differences of means if there's a significant variation seen between any of these means. Um, I'm showing in the top right hand corner just one graph of all the means um, that the ANOVA produced for us. We can see um, the diamonds here, and then the line going straight through the middle of the diamond is gonna be the mean. That's where the calculations are coming from. Um, on the bottom, I'm talking about PI labels, which is just uh, accessions, um, another word for accessions, how we identify them. Um, and again, I'm only showing one trait, but I did this for all of the traits, so I found um, 18 traits that were shown to be significant. But the first thing I wanted to do is make sure that this was true significance. It's not due to um, the model being skewed by any outliers. So that's where I go in with the studentized residual plot. It's a quick way for me to um, point out any outliers, anything falling outside of these two red lines is considered an outlier. And I only wanted to exclude the ones that were showing up over multiple traits. So that would be four outliers here on the bottom that I mentioned. I exclude those and you see um, one trait is no longer significant, but the other 17 are staying um, pretty significant in their variation. So I run this again, I look at um, to see if there's any outliers and I found three more. Again, uh, significance is staying the same for all of those 17 traits. I found a few more outliers and I ran it for a last time to find the same traits being significant and no more outliers. So I can um, pretty safely say that my model is being fit correctly, and these traits are truly showing significant variation. Um, now I'm gonna be looking at a principal component analysis. It's just a way to reduce dimensionality in my data set and um, give me a clustering analysis. So on the left here, or on, excuse me, on the right, we're looking at a loading plot, which is based off of the variables. You can see by color, this is, this is how the software um, clustered them together. And if you go in the turquoise area to the right, these are trending with the com um, component one, um, and they're all have a positive relationship with each other. And then the orange are um, all trending with component two and are showing um, a positive relationship with between those traits as well. If we look at the scoring plot now, we can see um, anything up on the Y axis, it's gonna also correspond to higher values in, um, the traits that are in orange, because those are kind of in the same spot on the plot, as well as these traits out here um, on the x-axis are going to correspond to higher values and um, the turquoise traits. And um, I just want to draw your attention to these two traits I forgot to mention on this last side, that um, this PI, it's not considered an outlier, but it is a higher than um, the other few traits. And so those are the two samples coming from that PI, which is um, something that we should take into account and really think about when we're running this analysis, um, because they are going to give us a good indication of higher values in area width, um, things of that nature, and that might be interesting to look at. I ran it one more time. Um, 
just without that, those two samples um, for more curiosity reasons, just to say, is this really changing the data and all? And um, it really didn't change the loading plot that much. It did cause it to have different clusters, but they're still all in the same general area, which is a good thing. Um, and the score plot um, becomes a little bit more condensed, but everything's still sitting right on that axis point. So I think it all looks um, pretty good with and without that um, PI. So from here, I can conclude that I had nine outliers coming from seven different accessions. Um, we might want to look into these outliers of why they are higher than the rest of their accession or lower. Um, and then 17 traits that are showing significant variation that will really help us in the future of this analysis. Um, and then of course that one PI that I just mentioned that could be pretty interesting to look at. So for the future of this project, it will be really interesting to see how um, these clustering of traits and how the variation within the traits um, pertain to the AMF colonization, if, it, if there's any relationship there. So few, our prior studies have already recognized that um, there might be an effect on the root morphology um, based on the AMF. So the more AMF that's going into the plant, um, the more nutrients it's taking up, and the ability for the roots to grow bigger, allowing the whole plant to grow bigger. Um, but the other way around, we haven't actually seen, or I haven't seen in prior studies of saying, is there certain um, traits or the way that the root um, is set up that is allowing more AMF to enter or is, you know, it doesn't want any more AMF. Um, and then one last thing, as we continue this study, um, we could, adjust our imaging protocol to get even um, better results and potentially look at the same number of replicates across all of the accessions. So um, if we have more replicates, we'll be able to look at a blocking effect that might, might happen in the field and also be able to determine if there's any differences in um, our harvesting time points, if there's more AMF, if there's a change in the root morphology throughout the time and why that's occurring. And um, then I just have my references and um, some acknowledgments of my mentors and, of course, Dr. Arnold um, for helping me. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. And again, if you want to ask questions, we encourage you to submit those questions in uh, the chat button. You can just click on it at the bottom of your, your screen and uh, I'll read your question to Brooke. And so uh, I'll just, uh, I'll prime the system with a, a few questions of my own. So um, what do you think about the idea that came out of the previous talk about taking those 33 traits and actually creating clusters of, uh, yeah, of, of, of clusters of the root architectures? Do you think that would be useful or interesting? Uh, yeah, I think that would be really cool. I, I liked um, what she had to say about um, looking at the plant first, and maybe we could do an initial categorization there and then look and see if those traits are still trending together um, right. based on those clumps of um, right. accessions. So I think that would be something interesting to look at. And it, I think uh, the principal component analysis kind of showed that traits uh, certain traits are trending with certain accession. Mm -hmm. So I think we could easily um, put them into different right. categories. Right. And then I guess the, the other thing is, um, so uh, some of the traits have to sort of do with like bushiness of the root system uh, or maybe the area of the root system. Did you, did you, any, did you, look at whether or not those kinds of traits uh, really um, had any effect on, uh, say, the log dry weight. So um, um, I have not looked okay. at the drug or the log dry weight um, mm -hmm. in this project, but I think, yes, that's something that's pretty important right. to look at in the future because it would be a good indication that, you know, as the roots are getting bigger, the plant itself is probably healthier and getting bigger as well. Right. And it's able to capitalize on AMF maybe b better. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And there's, so um, 
sorry to cut you off, but there is no, another no, part of the study um, that I have read before saying that AMF can actually be more um, har harmful to the plant if it's doing uh -huh. well on its own um, right. and because of that cost benefit um, relationship. Uh -huh. So that also might be something to look at is certain um, uh -huh. traits that might mean this the root is under stress and needs to pick up more AMF. Uh huh. Okay. That's wonderful talk and, and thank you. Thank and, you. Uh, <laughs> so I will now turn to uh, the next speaker, which is, uh, 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 we have a lot of Alex's. Uh, Alexandria Hodson is uh, uh, our next speaker. She's, uh, from I'm um, hopefully I'm getting she's from RIT which I'm going to associate with Rochester Institute of Technology uh, and uh, she is looking at um, new strategies of immunotherapy on cancers in dogs our our favorite friends and uh, she's doing this wor work with Dr. Shaying Zhao and Welcome, Alexandria, and look forward to your talk. Thank you, Dr. Arnold, for the introduction. So yes, my name is Alexandria Hodson. I study bioinformatics as well as biotechnology at the Rochester Institute of Technology. And I have been working in Dr. Zhao's lab over the summer to look at the procedure for sequencing the K9 um, multihistiocompatibility <laughs> complex allele DLA88. In particular, this presentation is going to be looking at the K9 memory tumor cell line um, 335. So let's jump right into this. So to begin with, I will be going over the materials and methods for this procedure. So our first step is cell growth and harvesting. This was mainly completed by my lab manager, Hannah Kavanaugh. Um, all of this took place in the tissue and cell culture lab. The cells were grown in a incubator that was set to 37 degrees Celsius for optimal cell growth. The media was changed quite frequently. It was normally um, every other day, so when we were in the lab, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. The plates were split rapidly whenever the cells had grown in the plate enough that we needed to split them, and sometimes we would harvest in order to get enough cells to be sent out to future labs, and other times we would be harvesting cells for the next step in the procedure, which is RNA extraction. So. Our harvested cells went in this floor centrifuge that I have pictured here that we have in the lab. Um, these cells, once harvested and centrifuged down, were stored in a negative 80 degree freezer until needed. And once retrieved from the freezer, they were thawed on our RNA bench, which we use specifically for all of our RNA extraction and purification to keep things clean. Um, we had to use a plunger to homogenize the mixture ahead of time as it was quite sticky. And we retrieved 600 microliters of the cells in order to use for purification. So as I said, for our purification steps, all of this occurs on our RNA bench that's pictured here. This step involves a lot of centrifuging. Um, we use one of the Kaijin RNUZ prep kits for this. So it involves using spin columns that one centrifuge will help to separate the RNA and the genomic DNA for a future study. So the RNA is what we are looking for in particular. That is what we are going to be using in the future for all of the next steps of the procedure. The genomic DNA gets saved for later for potential analysis by other labs or by our own lab in the future. All of our concentrations are read on the nanodrop so that we're aware of its purity as well as its quantity and quality. So after we've retrieved our RNA 
and purified it, we work to synthesize the cDNA. So we no longer have to work on the RNA bench, and we use the RNA that we've just retrieved and collected, and we combine that with a oligo -T, T mix, a DNTP mixture, and a DEPC treated water. All of this gets mixed together by pipetting and is annealed in the thermocycler at 65 degrees Celsius for about five minutes before being incubated on ice for another minute. We also are required to create a tube that has a buffer, DDT, a ribonuclease inhibitor, as well as reverse transcriptase, which is mixed and then added to that annealed RNA so that it can be incubated and diluted to have a template for PCR. So after running uh, a test PCR and knowing that we can get our product, we run a bulk PCR of the cell line. This right here is our bulk PCR specifically for CMT335. We run PCR in 60 microliter gels. We found that to be the most optimal thing. And we will recover these gels using um, a Zimeo gel recovery kit. Concentrations are measured on the nanodrop, and it's very important at this stage to make sure that the six microliters of PCR product that you recover has a high enough concentration that you can get one microgram of material for double digestion. So double digestion is when we take this PCR product and now work to cut out the specific part of the gene that we're going to be looking for. In our lab, we use ECO-R1 and BAM-H1 enzymes in order to do this. Double digestion is a three hour long procedure in which we add these enzymes at the beginning as well as halfway through their incubation at 37 degrees Celsius. Um, it is very important that double digestion gets run in a gel at the end in order to stop the reaction and this gel is normally 50 microliters. Here I have pictured um, what we ran for the double digestion. So that is still CMT335. Um, once we run and recover this, we measure the concentration again, and we begin the next step, which is ligation, transformation, and plating. This is when we add Pentria, which is our plasmid, we want to get a three to one molar ratio of these two ends up just being the same weight. This is a two hour room temp reaction. Once they have ligated so that we now have the plasmid and our PCR product together, um, we do transformation, which is when we take our CCDB and Endera E. coli strains and basically use frequent changes in temperature SOC as well as some shaking in order to get the E. coli to contain that ligated DNA. These are plated on LB and canamycin plates that we use on our E. coli bench alongside a burner in order to make sure that we don't spread any of the E. coli anywhere. And we use one plate for each strain. These plates are incubated at 37 degrees Celsius overnight. And here I have pictured the CCDB plate of E. coli that you can see a few colonies have grown. We then streak 10 colonies that we pick from the plate. In this case, only CCDB grew. We have had a couple issues with the endera colonies not growing for certain tumor cell lines, and in this case, CMT335 did not produce any endera colonies. So we streak five colonies on each plate, and once again, these are incubated at 37 degrees Celsius overnight. Then we run colony PCR, which we take one colony that's not touching any others from each one of the streaked plates. Um, so in this case, we had 10 colonies that we picked. These are used for amplification of the selected region using gene-specific primers. So this gets run in a large 150 microliter gel. As you can see here, um, colony one did not show up in the gel. Um, but we were able to recover the remaining nine colonies of CNT335. The final step 
when it comes to working in the lab is to send it out for sequencing. So these colony PCR samples need to be diluted to between 20 to 40 nanograms per microliter for optimal sequencing results. We mix the PCR product along with the forward 64 gene specific primer we use with water in order to get this dilution. And these tubes are sent out to Eurofin Genomics for sequencing. So the next slides I have here are going to pertain to the sequencing results that we obtained for our CMT335 colonies. And to begin with, we're gonna look at the chromatograms. So here, the picture at the top is what it looks like when I'm looking in Unigene Pro at the Sanger sequencing results that we retrieve. So these colonies were around 600 base pairs worth of DNA. And so here you can see both the chromatogram, which is the color Sanger sequencing, where each color represents one of the different base pairs, as well as a written out format of all of the base pairs that were sequenced. Now, it is phenomenal to see that when we run a quick NCBI blast on these sequences, it does identify the desired genes, DLA88, as well as some of the alpha-9 histio compatibility complexes. And the final step that we do right now involves um, genotyping the amino acid sequence. Now, this was done by Yuan Fang, and we genotype this specific gene. As you can see, the highlighted section in the top picture, we don't have an amino acid sequence for the entire gene, but we do have a good solid um, 200 amino acids that we are looking at. So two of the nine colonies actually ended up being an exact match for the DLA88 gene, which was phenomenal. And any slight variations that we saw were normally only a couple amino acids and could readily be explained by single point mutations and a variety of other things. So to discuss, um, these results will be used to further the knowledge of the DLA88MHC gene. Our aim is to be able to use this to engineer proteins and antibodies that will trigger T cell response in humans in order to be able to fight cancer through a way other than chemotherapy in, in a more natural way. We are very early on in the research, but our protocol is giving repeatedly good results. And in fact, we were just recently sent tumor samples from Spain to sequence using the same procedure. I would like to acknowledge the people that helped me along the way in this journey. I would like to thank Dr. Zhao for being a fantastic mentor and allowing me to work on her project in the first place. I'd like to thank Hannah Kavanaugh for being a great lab manager, helping me every step of the way, making sure I understood the purpose behind everything and how things worked. And I'd also like to thank Yuan Fang for continuing to do genotype work for the project despite having moved to Boston midway. Um, and finally, I'd like to thank Dr. Arnold for running this program and giving me the opportunity to work at UGA this summer. Any thank questions? You. Thank you so much. And so uh, for questions, just put in, uh, hit the, but button, the button at the bottom of your screen and type in your question and it will pop up on the screen and I'll of course read it, but uh, you'll get it right away. And so I, I of course had a, number of questions. So now you've got these uh, clone, a clone gene and um, you're going to have to, I guess you're going to have to express it. So are you going to, is the plan for someone will, or you will do the next step and express the, the protein and some expression vector derived from the clone that you got or so or, I know there is some hope to use CRISPR-Cas9 in particular in the future to okay. work on engineering these proteins and antibodies that uh -huh. we can then use to trigger that T cell response. Right. Okay. Yeah. So that's really, really exciting. And so do you think, um, do you think the, uh, 
the the pro you know the proteins that you do get expressed or these products do you think there's any chance that what's good for the dog is good for us <laughs> that is the hope um i mean the reason we're looking at canines in particular is because they uh -huh. do get cancer naturally and uh -huh. i know there are a couple genes that um, Dr. Zaslab lab has been looking into that we express in high quantities when we get cancer. Uh -huh. So we are making these comparisons in order to uh -huh. um, make that connection. Right. Oh, that sounds wonderful. So, um, uh, so, so there you have a collection of, uh, I guess, target proteins. How did you... Uh, I guess, how did you end up selecting this particular gene out of all the ones? It's just something that's connected with our immune system. There must have been a rationale for targeting it. Yes. Well, so DLA-88 in particular, I know, has had a lot of frequent research recently. And uh -huh. since it's for one of the um, major histocompatibility complexes, we picked uh -huh. this one in particular because I think we're looking for one that can receive a specific size of amino acid sequences uh -huh. okay. so that we can properly target. Okay. That sounds wonderful. Thank you for a wonderful talk. And uh, I will now uh, shift to our next speaker, uh, Ricky Liu, uh, he is uh, also going to be talking about arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, Ricky is uh, in Oconee High School uh, next door, and uh, part of REUs is to not only support uh, undergraduates, but promising uh, high school students as well. And so he is going to talk about uh, recognizing new features uh, of AMF fungi. And uh, welcome, Ricky. Thank you, Dr. Armel. Uh, so during the summer, uh, during the summer, under my mentor, Dr. Bundakar, um, I performed some analyzing calculations on detectron data. So. To understand the detectron data, uh, we have to first know that AMF fungi have a mutualistic relationship with uh, many plants. And because of this, fungi, these fungi will uh, grow in and around the roots of these plants. So if you look at the diagram here, you can see the, uh, you can see the fungal structures that are being formed near the root. So the fungal hyphae and spore and arbuscule, which is where the nutrients such as phosphorus and nitrogen are given to the plant while the plant gives uh, nutrients like carbohydrates to the fungi. And to study this relationship, uh, many microscope pictures were taken of plant roots with these fungal structures in them. Uh, a total of 55,000 pictures uh, is the data set. And the goal there was to be able to basically draw a circle around each of the structures, like draw a circle around this arbuscule and be able to label it an arbuscule. The only issue, one option was to manually uh, label each and every one of these pictures, which is a big job because it's 55,000 pictures. So the option that was taken was using Detectron, which is a convolutional neural network uh, from Facebook, and using that on a test, uh, on a training set of data to basically segment each one of those 55,000 pictures. And here's an example of one of the pictures that was run through Detectron. Uh, on the top right, you can clearly see the hyphae uh, in blue that is in the picture, and there would be 55,000 of these pictures that would be run through Detectron. And essentially what Detectron would do was try to give coordinates that would form a polygon around uh, the structure that it, that it identifies and output that, uh, output those coordinates. So this is an example of 
uh, detectron output, uh, you can see the type of structure on the left right here. You can see this is a root or an external hyphae. Um, and to the right of that, you can see all the points that it gives. Uh, many of these point sets could consist of thousands of points, um, which is why you can't actually see the all points Y right now, but it's a very large data set uh, of points that you would need to find uh, calculations for. So our goal with this project was to basically find the lengths of many of these structures by approximating it by using the detectron uh, polygons and finding the maximum distances between two points on the detectron polygon. And then I would group these maximum distances by these by the different uh, structure types. And then I would uh, by the different structure types, and then I would take the average and then put it into a bar to put the averages into a bar graph. And this is an example of the uh, coordinates basically graphed, graphed uh, using MATLAB. And the maximum distance uh, you could see would probably be from the bottom left to the top right. So the first, to do this, uh, you would have to first extract each one of these numbers. Uh, and each one of these numbers is actually within a very large string. So you would need to have a function that finds a decimal, every single decimal in that string. And uh, after running that function, some of these, some of these data sets would have upwards of 2000 points. Some might have a couple hundred, uh, but it's a very large point set. And then after you get those points, you would run two for loops, and then you would find the maximums, maximum distance uh, from that. So this is the result of running that on all 55,000 uh, detectron outputs. And you could see that the root is the biggest, which makes sense. It's part of the plant. The fungi will be smaller. Uh, one thing, one issue that was raised to me was that the hyphae are actually smaller than the autobuscule, uh, according to this, which is not supposed to be true. If you remember the diagram all the way before, the hyphae is very clearly bigger than the arbuscule. So uh, in terms of length, it should be longer than the arbuscule. But in this, it shows that it's not as long as the arbuscule. So with that issue raised to me, uh, I took a look at the detectron data actually overlaid with the polygon. So on the bottom left, you can see a small blue polygon uh, on this picture. And Detectron made that. that. That was one of the Detectron outputs. And what Detectron thinks is inside is an external hyphae. Uh, and you can clearly see why using the maximum distance is not a great measurement of the length of the hyphae. Uh, since the hyphae curves around a lot um, in the polygon, uh, it makes the maximum distance actually far less than what would be expected uh, in terms of the length of the hyphae. So there were a few ways that were suggested to me to fix this. Uh, one uh, that I thought of was to you can actually see that the hyphae is darker than its surroundings. So maybe you could take the number of pixels that are darker. And since the hyphae are linear in shape, you could uh, approximate its length with the number of dark pixels there were. Um, there were some issues with getting that uh, done, unfortunately. And another, another solution that could, be, that could work is contour tracing that was suggested to me by my mentor. Uh, unfortunately, I did not have enough time to uh, implement that.
Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Ricky. I a wonderful presentation. I I did have uh, some questions, and again, anyone who wants to ask questions about uh, his project, just please hit the button at the bottom, uh, and I'll type your question in, and I'll I'll read it back, and we'll all see it. The um, so the one question I had is it. Um, as you point out, the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi seem, in some cases, to be like you show there, have a uh, high, high, a, a larger length. Uh, I mean, it could be the choice of measure that you used, but the other possibility is that some of the arbuscules are are sort of uh, were scored as a kind of cloudy net of uh, individual arbuscules and maybe that's what's uh, uh, causing the the length to be so long is that did did you notice anything like that in some of the images that you looked at or uh, uh, I that was certainly uh, something that I saw when I did overlay some pictures. I don't uh -huh. think I put any on the slides, but um, yeah, there were co a couple of our bus tools that seemed to be put right. together in one polygon. Right. Um, yeah, it, so, that was uh -huh. also. Yeah, so there there are at least possible two explanations. One's the arbuscule categories really needs to be subdivided further into big arbuscules and little arbuscules that might but i think the other thing is just like you say you're trying these other length measures that might might work differently as well so um the uh yeah so i think that's uh uh It'll be very nice to have these other properties for each of the structures. Uh, they may they may give us clues uh, as to how well the AMF are colonizing uh, the, the organism, so the plant. And uh, so, do you in the training set, which only had like seven or eight hundred? Do you? recall how long it took that to be done manually and it's not really completely done the training set yeah there was a training set to create the de detectron um yeah. and maybe i never mentioned it but uh it's probably it's probably two years of work something like that <laughs> or a year, something at least that. So it's probably not possible to do manually 55,000 segments. Yeah. So, okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we'll resume at 1 p.m. And uh, thank you for all the, to all the speakers and their wonderful presentations. And uh, we'll see you back at 1. So long. Don't go.
Welcome to a return to the uh, 2022 RU Virtual Symposium in Genomics and Computational Biology. I hope you will remember and be encouraged to submit questions uh, at the text box below that says, Ask the Speaker. You can enter that at any time during uh, the, the speaker's talk and we'll present it at the end to have an interaction with the speaker. So my speaker uh, today is uh, Ms. Cameron Felt. I uh, hope I'm remembering correctly. She's a genetics major at the University of Georgia. Uh, and she ha has been, is part of uh, the AMF Sorghum Project. Uh, and she is going to be talking to us about capturing environmental data uh, that may have an influence on AMF colonization. So I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Cameron and uh, welcome. Thank you. So I did uh, my summer project on gathering weather data for a field study on AMF colonization and sorghum bicolor. So just some background on the field study. So overall, the field study is looking at sorghum bicolor and its relationship with arbuscle mycorrhizal fungi, also known as AMF. And AMF is a fungi found in soil that has a symbiotic relationship with plants by providing vital nutrients to the plant and then also protecting the plant from fungal pathogens. And then in return, the plant provides lipids and sugars for the fungi. And then sorghum is the world's fifth most important cereal and um, can thrive in a lot of different climates. And sorghum has been recognized for its relationship with AMF for many years, varying among different genotypes. And due to its high productivity and stress tolerance, sorghum is a really great um, model plant for this study. And so to start, we had 87 accessions of sorghum planted in the greenhouse so that the plants could germinate. And then once the plants were seedlings, they were transferred um, to the field at Wellbrook Farm in Athens, Georgia. And all of these accessions um, were planted in each of the three blocks. So um, that resulted in a total of about 1,500 plants. And for any seeds that didn't germinate the first time around, um, they were planted again in the greenhouse and then transferred to the field at um, a later date. And all of these plants are um, hopefully going to be harvested sometime in August, and their roots will be imaged in order to study AMF colonization. So overall, the purpose of this um, large field study is to determine the sorghum genes that recruit and support the AMF community that leads to high sorghum biomass yield under a known range of environmental conditions and to then build predictive models from the obtained data. And so my project was to install a weather station um, in the field to further understand the genotype and environmental um, interaction on AMF colonization. So to start, um, we developed a program on the Campbell Scientific PC400 software so that we could obtain data from the data logger. And we used six CS650-655 soil sensors um, that were connected to a CR6 data logger, a 12 volt battery, and a terminal bus kit, which you can see here on the image on the right. And the weather station was set up in the field with all six sensors spread out um, among all three of the blocks. And so here we have um, a map of the field. So you can see blocks A, B, and C. And the yellow highlighted box represents where um, the weather station was placed. And then the blue and purple highlighted boxes are the two accessions of um, sorghum that we chose um, to place the sensors. So essentially we had two sensors in each block and the sensors were on the rows of um, those particular accessions. So the sensors were dug about um, a foot in the ground and buried, and these sensors um, measure many different things like volumetric water content, electrical conductivity, temperature, permittivity, period average, voltage ratio, all of those things. And data was collected every second, every hour, um, and a table was produced with averages and standard deviations. Um, that's just the way we had our program running. And so unfortunately, when we went to go retrieve the data from the data logger, um, we had some complications with battery life um, in our program. And so we weren't able to get the data from the data logger. But um, this data that I'm going to show you today and that I analyzed is from the same field study, but just um, last year, so last summer's data. Um, 
And this data was under all the same conditions um, that I just presented to you. However, they only had three sensors instead of six. And so essentially these three sensors were placed um, in each block of the field. So block A is B and C. So the first data I looked at was our weather data and volumetric water content. So this graph on the left shows the total rain on days 162 through 182. Um, and so you can see from about day 172 to about 175, um, we had a increase um, in total rain. So naturally I wanted to go look at the volumetric water content over time as well to see how this total rain affected the soil. So um, the graph on the right shows that and each color represents a different block. So the blue line is block A, red is block B, and green is block C. And so you can see around day 172, we have um, a dramatic increase in um, volumetric water content in the soil, which is consistent with our um, graph on the left, which is total rain. So as you know, the rain increased, we had an increase in the volumetric water content in the soil. And so I wanted to continue with this and look at the other um, the other variables that the soil sensors can measure. So first graph we have is the um, electrical conductivity over time. And electrical conductivity um, is essentially the measure of the soil's salinity and is a really good indicator of nutrients, availability and loss, available water, um, and soil texture. So you can see that it has that same increase around day 172 for that um, week that we had that increase in total rain. And the next variable is the voltage ratio, which is essentially um, just the change of voltage over time. And that also had the same increase. And um, lastly, we have permittivity, which is um, the ability of this, um, the soil to hold an electrical charge. And that also had a significant um, increase um, at the same time that the total rain increased. So I thought these um, this graph comparison was just um, good to show to show how the um, available water really has um, an effect on these different variables that um, our soil sensors can measure. So the next thing I wanted to look at was um, wa uh, volumetric water content and permittivity. And so like I just mentioned, permittivity um, in soil is its ability to hold an electrical charge. So we can see the graph um, on the right as the permittivity in the soil increases, the volumetric water content also increases, but um, kind of increases to a certain point and starts to level out. Um, and this really does make sense with what we already know about soil and the fact that um, there's a threshold for the amount of um, water that soil can hold. And so this graph um, really just reinforces that. And lastly, I just wanted to talk about the future of the study. So we're hoping to work through some of the problems that we faced this summer um, with the data logger and weather station by hopefully rewriting the program to be able to collect an effective amount of data without overworking um, the battery life of our system. And so our next steps um, are going to be to replace the battery and hopefully get the system up and running so that in the coming years, soil data can be collected um, over a longer period of time. And hopefully we can start to really understand the environmental um, interaction that um, it has on AMF colonization. And yeah, that is all I have. Thank you for the wonderful talk. I was wondering, do you think you'll have uh, that we can correlate that data with what Amelia's collecting on, you know, she's made this uh, uh, hypothesis that the outbreaks she's seeing in the field are correlated with what you're measuring mm -hmm. so yeah i think that there once we um obviously can get all the little things worked out i think having the weather data and um, data from all the soil sensors will be able to like um, really look at a lot of different things and um, it'll be really interesting so yeah i think that'll definitely be correlated and as i said all you have to do is click on the the text question for a speaker what ask the speaker and uh we'll post your question and so the other thing i was sort of interested in what were some of the very other variables like it did did it allow you to measure humidity in the soil no so we have data on the humidity but that is from um the weather data not from the soil sensors okay so yes and we have it but just not from the soil and 
What about, does it do any kind of temperature measurement on the soil? Yes. As, okay. Yes, we do. So have that's that. another variable. Mm -hmm. Yes, there and, are a lot of different variables um, to play with when it comes to um, all the stuff the soil sensors measure, for sure. And, and so you were basically showing the ones that had a big change mm -hmm. uh, during the course of the study. Yes. So we have to consider them. Okay. That sounds great. So, um, it, and what are some of your solutions for, uh, uh, for making the, the, uh, uh, it, it, making sure all six sensors stay online without running yes. out of juice? Yes. One thing I think that I think will help a lot is by rewriting the program to not collect data every second. I think that okay. was last year, I know the battery only lasted about a month and that was with three right. sensors. And so we changed the amount of sensors, but we didn't rewrite the program or anything. So I think okay. if we collect um, still enough data, but just not as often, um, right. hopefully we won't overwork the battery. Um, right. And then there's always the option of looking at like getting a higher voltage battery. Um, right. So I think just playing around with both of those factors could really influence okay. the amount of data that we could get. Okay. That's fantastic. So um, I guess uh, thank you so much, and we'll uh, we'll bring in the, the next speaker. Uh, this is uh, uh, going to be Adeline Brown. Uh, she's from Arizona State University, uh, and she worked with uh, Marin Brewer uh, this summer. And again. You can pose questions to her by uh, uh, clicking on the little text that says ask a question. And uh, um, so we're uh, uh, grateful for her being here and she's gonna look at uh, look, look at uh, azole resistant Aspergillus fumigatus. And, and uh, that's gonna be uh, exciting. So I turn it over to her and uh, welcome Adeline. For that introduction, Dr. Arnold. Um, as he previously said, I'm going to be talking about the fitness class of azole resistant Aspergillus fumigatus. And this is a project done by me as well as my postdoc mentor, Lisa. Um, so this little guy right here is Aspergillus. Um, the biological classification of Aspergillus fumigatus is a fungi, and out of everything on this chart right here, I think the most important part to point out is the phylum. This phylum is um, typically what we see pathogenic fungi um, are classified as in this phylum. Um, so this is a human pathogenic fungi, um, but many, plant, both plant and human pathogenic ones are usually characterized in here. And so the distribution of Aspergillus fumigatus is found all over the world um, in both agricultural and industrial environments. Um, it is carried throughout the air with these little conidia um, or spores. And because of this, they're very, very, very small and it makes it very easy for them to be dispersed all around us. And we often inhale these conidia um, because they're so small. Honestly, sitting in this room, I could be breathing in um, Conidia right now, um, as well as you guys all watching. However, this does not mean that you will get the disease. Um, this disease called aspergillosis is caused by breathing in aspergillus and becoming infected, but it's a combination of conditions between the fungus as well as the host. And this usually means the host has a lowered immune response. So as you can see from here, um, if you have a higher immune response, you might have like an allergic reaction, so maybe some sneezing, things like that. But then if you have a more lowered immune response, such as being infected with COVID, being freshly out of a surgery and other aspects, it can develop into more severe aspergillosis. And so to treat aspergillosis, there are three different antifungal treatments, but the first line of treatment are azoles. Azoles, um, attack the ergestinol biosynthesis pathway, 
and the other two are not often used because they have various health issues such as um, host toxicity and um, less effectiveness. And then if you use too much of it, it can actually benefit the fungi that is being that is infecting you. However, we've been seeing a rise in a Zoli resistant Aspergillus fumigatus um, due to the CYP51A gene that prevents the linesterol path, um, linesterol synthesis. And we believe this is because as we're seeing them, we see these Azoli resistant Aspergillus fumigatus um, arise in the agricultural environment. And this is because of Zoli's being used almost as like a pesticide against other pathogenic fungi. And so while these Azolis aren't meant to target Aspergillus fumigatus on these plants in itself, it is causing a rise in resistant Aspergillus fumigatus. And because of this, um, mortality rate for those with Aspergilliosis um, caused by um, Azoli resistant Aspergillus fumigatus is almost 100%. So as you can see from this chart, this is all the associated um, resistant Aspergillus fumigatus that have been recorded. And the most common ones are the tandem derp repeats 34 and 46 in the CYP51A gene. This means that there is a repeat of 34 or 46 nucleotides, depending on whichever one it is. And this causes the azoles to not be effective when targeting um, the fungi. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to see if there was a fitness cost of this azole resistant Aspergillus fumigatus. And so our goal was to determine if there's a fitness to cost of azole resistance in streams of A fumigatus from agricultural environments and compare these fitness par parameters of susceptible strains and strains diverse resistant phenotypes and genotypes under different growth conditions. And this is important to note because if there is a fitness cost of these azole resistant Aspergillus fumigatus, then it could provide evidence that if we stop using azoles on different plants, then we should see a decline in these azole resistant Aspergillus fumigatus and a rise in wild type once again. So, our materials and methods were fairly greatly illustrated in this chart right here. So we took 15 wild type, 15 TR34, and 15 TR46 because those are the two most common allele types um, for resistance. And we grew them in PDA slants, and then we suspended these and plated them. We wanted to measure the growth rate at four different temperatures as well as sporulation at four different temperatures. And then we also measured them at two different incubation periods, 48 hours and 72 hours. Many fitness cost experiments with Aspergillus thus far have been only measured at 37 degrees. So we wanted to expand what temperatures we were measuring this at um, because in the agricultural environment where they thrive the most, um, there's a lot of compost and compost gets up into these higher temperatures as seen below. And then we also wanted to see what it was more like just a moderate temperature. Then what we did is after we grew these, we also grew them in triplicate. So we had more data and more of an average to find our true mean. And then here is um, some of the work that we've done over the past month and a half-ish as we've been completing this experiment. You can see my lovely coworkers um, counting spores. That was the most difficult part of the project. And there's me labeling tubes and such. It was a very fun time, but also very stressful. Here we have um, our first set of data, which is the growth rate. We measured the growth in diameter at 48 and 72 hours, as you can see in the first A and then B. And then we also measured them over 25, 37, 45, and 50 degree temperature incubations. And as indicated by the arrows, you can see that there does appear to be a fitness cost of TR46 allele at 25 degrees Celsius. And then there also appears to be a fitness cost of TR34 
at 37 degrees Celsius at a 48 hour incubation period. However, we want to look into that one more just because um, as you can see with the 72 hour, um, it evens back out and there's no significant difference between the three alleles. And so this might indicate maybe some error or it could just be something true. The amount of spores um, recorded over these times and temperatures, same um, temperature incubations and time periods, you have 48 hours on the left and 72 hours on the right. And here it was very exciting because we see a similar trend throughout time. There's more variance when you hit 72 hours, but that's because it has more incubation. And we measured a um, difference at the TR34 allele um, that indicates a fitness cost at that temperature, which is very interesting because that is when you start to get those hotter temperatures of compost, uh, which helps support the idea that if we stop using azoles in the agricultural environment, that there may be a rise in wild type once again. And then all of my data was run in R on using ANOVA um, to compare each different um, allele at each different temperature. And some future directions that we want to have is um, measure the germination and germination tube lengths of the variants uh, to see if there's a fitness cost for that as well. And then we also want to measure the competition um, between the, the different strains um, to see if the wild type outcompetes the um, strains or vice versa. And then we also want to repeat this with more resistant strains to see um, if the trend is continued. And then I would just like to thank all of the partners that I've had in this experiment. Um, Dr. Maren Brewer was my um, personal professor advisor and she was really, really great. And also Dr. Jonathan Arnold for um, providing this program and giving me such wonderful experience here. And then also I wanted to thank my postdoc, Luisa Gomez, and then Marcel and Christian were two other workers in our lab that weren't with us, our experiment, but helped me count scores for the 1,080 samples that we had. So without them, I would not have data. So thank you. Thank you for the wonderful talk. and. I can encourage you to submit questions just by clicking on the task, ask the speaker at the bottom of the screen. And uh, uh, to encourage it, I'll, I'll just ask a few questions. Uh, the, you've, you've looked at uh, sort of spore counts, and, but there could be other measures of fitness that are affected. Uh, and I'm just wondering if if you're contemplating that you could say say for example there might be uh, you know some uh, do you have uh, you know you could talk about you know the number of spores maybe uh, germination time um, I mean there there are different parts of the life history you could measure success in. I, I'm just wondering what your thoughts were on that. A lot of different things that we can measure. Um, germination tube, we actually have them in the lab right now, um, a sample uh -huh. for measuring germination. Um, the spore count took a lot longer than what we thought it was going to take. So <laughs> <laughs> I was counting spores probably up until like about this week. Um, uh -huh. So we still have to measure germination, but yes, um, there are a multitude of factors that can go into fitness. And so that's why growth rate and the sporulation are just a small right. portion of that. So hopefully right. we can look at the germination. And like I said, we want to do a competition analysis uh -huh. as well to see if there's other factors that show that they outcompete the other when they're competing uh -huh. for resources. Um, and yeah. Yeah, so yeah, it's wonderful. So and it is it may even are you're going to do some kind of you're thinking in terms in the competition experiment doing some kind of mixture experiment where you know you could 
have two types being put together, but you could maybe control the proportions of each or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. Um, I will say one thing that was interesting as well is um, my postdoc, she performed a small scale experiment for this before we got into the big scale experiment. And uh -huh. we were expecting to see actually a, um, a fitness advantage at 50 degrees um, because that's what we observed on the smaller scale experiment. Uh -huh. So it was like, whoa, everything, it actually doesn't. Um, but when I was creating, when I was doing my ANOVA analyses at each temperature, um, I was creating strip charts for each one. And there's a massive amount of variance for every single allele at those temperatures. So I'm assuming uh -huh. it was just the one that grows better was the one that uh -huh. happened to get picked in the draw. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, so do you have any any thoughts of how you might, if you were interested in the effect on the it as an opportunistic pathogen do you, could you envision somehow passaging uh the uh the the organism the path opportunistic pathogen through a mouse or or something like that and uh looking at uh, what comes out the other end i never thought of that but that's actually a really great idea there's been um I recently attended a seminar. There's been a lot of research on these um, aspergillus, these azole resistant aspergillus. So it'd be good to see um, how opportunistic they are. And uh -huh. obviously not us humans, because that would be <laughs> harmful right. to our health, but <laughs> seeing in other animals as well, um, uh -huh. how it becomes or how it performs and seeing what the effects are compared to the okay. wild type. Yeah, and then the last question I have is, um, uh, David Geiser has worked on Fumigatus at Penn State, and it was su somewhat surprising to me that they actually uh, uh, colonize corals. So have you read or s seen anything more of that story? It's not just us, but uh, other organisms like coral reefs and things. I have not. I've seen a little bit about um, other forms in which it colonizes them. Um, uh -huh. But a lot of my research and reading papers has been specifically on the um, agricultural effect um, okay. on aspergillus because um, while people are getting infected with this, there's no um, indication that the resistance was caused in the medical sense. Uh -huh. And so that's where it's believed now that in the agricultural aspect, um, Azole is used almost to, to treat other forms of fungi have yes. by chance just gained this resistance. Yes. Well, thank you very much, Adeline. Wonderful talk. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Arnold. <laughs> so I will now introduce our our next speaker, um, uh, Trig V. McDonald. He's a, a, a from UGA. And uh, he's, he's looking at, uh, I would say, the genomics of nutrition. And he has a, a wonderful project he's going to describe uh, in the lab of Kai Xiang Yi. Uh, welcome, Trig V. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Arnold. Um, today I'll be talking about the uh, interaction analysis of fish oil intake with phenotypic and genotypically predicted blood lipids. So to start off, um, you might know, almost 94 million Americans uh, currently suffer from high cholesterol. Uh, this can put them at risk for other diseases, um, one of which is heart disease. That's the leading cause of death in America. Others are stroke. Uh, so it's not good. Um, so how could, we, how could we use genetics to help solve this? Um, well, using data from almost 500,000 individuals in the UK Biobank, um, we created a polygenic risk score um, that'll generate an estimate of risk for something like high cholesterol for an individual. Uh, and that'll be based on these weighted values for important SNPs. Uh, I'll get 
more into the details that more into the details on that in a minute. Um, but with this, um, if we have an individual's genetic data, we could put that into this, uh, this sort of equation. And it'll spit out what their risk is for this disease. Um, and then in this study, uh, I'm going to take this even a step further to see not just how we can use the genome uh, to look at how it affects blood lipid levels um, like cholesterol, but how something like fish oil supplementation uh, might interact with this genome uh, to change these lipid levels. So some important terms, um, the blood lipids that I looked at um, are TC, that's total cholesterol, HDL, that's the high density cholesterol, um, LDL, that's low density cholesterol, and TAGs, that just stands for triglycerides. Some other terms are PRS, that stands for polygenic risk score, um, GWAS, that's the genome-wide association study, this is where we um, find out the important SNPs for um, predicting these different blood lipids um, and what effects these SNPs have. Uh, and what is a SNP? That's a, a single nucleotide polymorphism. That's like the variation at a certain site um, within our genetic data. So a quick overview of the methods. I won't bog us down in the nitty gritty of the technical details, but um, so I used uh, about 500,000 individuals in the UK Biobank. Um, they're imported to the computing cluster here at UGA. Um, I did quality control on them using Plink. That's a genomic software. Um, I did it on the individual data as well as the SNPs. Um, I imported summary statistics of the GWAS. Um, I used some formatted files of that. Uh, then I performed clumping. I'll talk more about that in a moment. I created the polygenic risk scores, and then I created some linear models and some scatter plots to help us predict the blood lipids. So clumping, um, what is this? This is a tool that can help us to account for something known as linkage disequilibrium. That's where if we have um, something like an important SNP uh, for a phenotype, um, if it's important, it'll have a statistical signal such that um, It'll bring, I guess, the other SNPs in the area around it. It'll say that these are important too because those SNPs are likely inherited together if they're close together on a chromosome. So we can account for that um, by only using what we think is the most important SNP in the area. It's likely that only the most significant SNP is actually um, having an effect on this phenotype. Um, as you can see in the plot to the right, this is an example plot I generated in R as part of my uh, training. Um, you see there are a lot of dots there um, that are above the red line. That's the significance threshold. Um, but it's likely that only one of those dots, probably the one at the very top or somewhere around there, is actually having an effect on whatever phenotype we're measuring. Um, so we just take the top one, and that helps reduce some confounding. Um, and it can improve our polygenic risk score. Uh, the criteria is there if you want to look at it. Um, and then I use this list of clump SNPs to, um, to help make the PRS. I only use these. I didn't use every single SNP. I just wanted the important ones that I thought might have an effect. So using that list of SNPs, um, you combine that with um, the summary statistics from the GWAS output, um, which will give you an effect size. Uh, and you can create what's known as a polygenic risk score. Um, this will help us to predict the blood lipids for the four phenotypes. Um, I took these polygenic risk scores and I tested them for correlation against the blood lipids as sort of a preliminary measure. How good is it at predicting these blood lipids? Um, the uh, table in the bottom right that shows the correlation, um, just a quick correlation test using the uh, Spearman statistic. Um, it's about 0.2, which is <laughs> not great. Uh, it's a weak correlation, but that's about typical for a, uh, a polygenic risk score, especially on traits that are so broad, um, like cholesterol, that have so many different genetic factors and environmental factors influencing them. Uh, I created some plots as well. Um, you'll notice that the R values are 
again, sort of weak. That can be reflected in the in the scatter plots, sort of a, a messy cloud. Um, but there is a slight uh, linear trend to it. Uh, nonetheless, the p-values are very significant. Um, they're not actually even the negative 16. Uh, that's just the limit that the correlation software uh, displays. So it's much lower than that. Um, then I moved on to the next step of my analysis. I stratified them by uh, both sex and um, by fish oil status. So I don't know if you guys can see it, maybe a bit blurry. There's a lot of graphs on here. Um, but the, um, the phenotype that really stands out to me, uh, some of them are, they don't really have much difference, but with the HDL, that's high density uh, cholesterol, the, um, the fish oil and non-fish oil groups, they have a notable difference. Um, the female, the females with, without fish oil, they have a relatively high R value and the um, the males with fish oil have a relatively low R value. So that's a, a notable difference between the two. Um, the fish oil groups also have just in general lower p-values, I guess less significant p-values. I think this is likely because there are fewer samples within this type of group, just because <laughs> more people don't take fish oil than do. Um, there's also some interesting things going on with the triglycerides. Um, we see that the uh, females who are not taking tri or who are not taking fish oil have a, a lower correlation um, with the PRS, whereas like uh, the males and females that do take uh, fish oil, the PRS is better at predicting their triglyceride level. So then I created some linear models. The first uses only the PRS, so that would be akin to um, to what I just showed you. Um, the second linear model, it includes the PRS, but it includes things like sex, age, and some other uh, covariates. Uh, and the third one uses all the prior terms, then it adds BMI and the Townsend Deprivation Index, which is sort of a measure of poverty, a measure of uh, material deprivation. Um, and I use these linear models to help predict the blood lipids, and I plotted the results. So you can see here that um, this greatly improved the correlation um, for the HDL. Uh, it increased it from about 0.2 before, if you recall, to about uh, almost 0.6, which is fantastic. Um, we may be at risk of overfitting just because of so many uh, so many covariates in the model, but um, this is a great increase. Um, only a slight increase for total cholesterol and LDL, uh, but for the triglycerides, that's TAG. Um, there was a moderate increase as well. Um, and then I wanted to see how fish oil would interact with this. Um, so I used that linear model that I just showed you, the third tier, the highest one, um, and I introduced fish oil status as another covariate. But it wasn't just added to the equation like with the others, um, where they would be independent of each other. I wanted to see how it interacted with the PRS to change this. Uh, so I added it to the equation with the multiplication, um, and I wanted to see if this improved the model or not. I, th I used the, uh, I think it's pronounced Akaike uh, information criterion um, to compare models. Um, this is a penalized approach where if you add too many um, variables to it and overfit the model, it'll penalize you. Uh, I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to overfit the, the graph. So um, you'll notice this one has additional, additional variables added in, yet it's still um, better. Even if it's just slightly better. <laughs> um, the information criterion said that this was uh, this was a better model. Um, so we succeeded in doing that. It helped us to better predict uh, our blood lipids when we added in fish oil. Um, and then I wanted to see how this interaction was actually uh, taking part in the model. Um, the p-values are, they're significant, but they're not like wildly significant. The PRSP values, those were like negative 300. Um, it's like 300 zeros. That's a lot. 
Uh, compared to this, it's relatively minor, but it's still significant to a degree. Um, interestingly, only the HDL has a positive estimate, meaning that um, it has a positive coefficient within the model. Um, I don't know why that is, but that's the case. Um, so to conclude, um, we were able to successfully create a polygenic risk score to help us predict uh, the blood lipid levels in individuals. And we added in covariates such as sex and age. Those were relatively important covariates uh, when I looked at the p-values. Uh, they greatly improved the predictive power of the models. Um, we introduced fish oil as, a, as an interaction. It improved the model um, to, to a slight degree, but it still improved it. Um, and then these models, uh, they could be useful in helping to predict a patient's blood lipid levels. Um, I think this would be most useful for HDL, just given the, uh, the R value. Uh, it seemed like that was the best of the four. Um, However, uh, I will note that this used only European data from the UK Biobank to avoid population structure issues. Uh, so that might be one limitation. It would be useful in European populations, but somewhat less so in non-Europeans. And that could be a, a direction of future research um, to expand this to be able to be applied to uh, other groups, um, which would help them to seek treatment sooner and might help us to uh, lower the rate of um, heart disease in America and other countries, hopefully. Um, that's about it. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Yi for allowing me to do research in his lab this summer. It was a great opportunity, and I'm happy to be able to work on the computational side of genetics. Uh, I'd also like to thank Yi Tong Sun for guiding me through the process, and uh, Michael Francis as well for uh, helping me with learning R and graphing and all of that, it certainly was, uh, took a while, but we got it done. Thank you for all the kudos to the speaker. And, and again, you can uh, encourage questions. Uh, the questions can be uh, obtained by just putting a chat, uh, pushing, uh, ask the qu question of the speaker. And I think we already have a question. And here it is, it's on the screen. Hi, Trigvi. Nice work. What are the ages of the test group? These are human samples, correct? Yes, these are human samples. Um, they came from the UK Biobank, so it's not, uh, you wouldn't typically get like children in there. I think it's mostly uh, middle aged, um, usually European people that sign up for this. Um, it's like a voluntary process, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so about middle age, maybe 40s, 50s or so. Mm -hmm. That's the usual group, I think. Okay. Oh, we have another question for you. I'll read it just to help you out. Higher HDL is associated with lower heart disease. In terms of recommendation for raising HDL, do you think people with high PRS benefit more from the fish oil? Mm, interesting. Yeah, that might be one application of the interaction. Um, Maybe. Um, I'm certainly a proponent of fish oil. Um, Omega-3s are certainly useful. Um, I didn't talk about Omega-3s really in, in this one. Um, but I think that that could um, help it, I think. Um, yeah. HDL is sort of called like the, uh, the good cholesterol. Right. Uh, sometimes I'm not sure how accurate that is. It seems kind of like a black and white. Uh, classification of it. I think it's more complex than that. But omega-3s in general, I think, are good, a lot of which are found in fish oil, and a lot of people's diets can be deficient in that. Um, I think that if you were at risk for heart disease, I don't think it would hurt to, <laughs> to take fish oil um, by any means. I, I think we actually have a third question for you. I'll read it again. UK, UK Biobank have samples of different ancestries, European, African. How do you control for the possible confounding effects of different ancestries? Yeah, that's where the, uh, the population structure part of uh, GWAS and this whole field comes in. Um, with this, when we originally did our uh, analysis, we did not control for that at all. 
But then we went back and we filtered out um, individuals uh, in the quality control step so that it was just European individuals. There were other factors such as like withdrawn consent, um, genetic sex mismatching and all that. But one of the criteria was um, that they were of European descent and that their uh, genetic data um, aligned with that. Okay, and uh, that was a wonderful talk, and thank you, and uh, w w I hope to talk to you more about doing GWASs. Yeah. I okay, so um, our next speaker uh, is Anna Prestel. Uh, she's also a, a recent graduate from the University of Georgia. She's uh, on the DOE AMF Sorghum Project, and uh, she is going to be talking about high throughput imaging of sorghum roots to see what they're doing. Welcome. Thank you. So today I'm going to be talking about using bright field imaging to look at the AMF morphology in sorghum roots. So a little bit of background on AMF is that it's a fungi which that helps facilitate nutrient uptake by the sorghum plant. And so if you look at the diagram, it is able to facilitate that nutrient exchange because of the extensive branching of the hyphae network that allows the plants to reach beyond its rhizosphere. And so when this happens, the AMF leaves behind structures in the plant roots that can be visualized. So the structures that I will be focusing on today are known as external hyphae, internal hyphae, vesicles, and arbuscules. And like I said before, the hyphae are responsible for extending the network and moving nutrients around. The vesicles act as a storage unit for energy, and the arbuscules are locations where the nutrient exchange between the fungi and the plant occurs. So AMF morphology is being studied as part of a large five-year project that aims to look at the relationship between genes, AMF, and the environment. And so previously, the procedure to view AMF morphology was performed with a microscope that was very time-consuming, and it's not feasible for the amount of samples being collected. So this project aims to develop a high throughput scanning profile that would optimize time and image output for this large volume project. So the process started all the way back with harvesting the roots, which was accomplished by collecting three cassettes, which are just small containers that each contained 0.25 grams of root um, from each plant. And then the next step is clearing and staining the roots. And so clearing the roots not only cleans the root to help with the clarity, but it also makes them transparent and staining allows the structures to be visualized under the microscope. And once this was done, the samples were then mounted on slides, which were then put into the Zeiss AxioScan 7 Brightfield microscope. So due to the large volume of samples being processed, many of the roots were frozen after harvesting and to perform the clearing procedure, um, they first had to thaw for 30 minutes. And then the cassettes were placed in a one to three solution of household ammonia with surfactant in H2O2 for another 30 minutes. And so after this step, they were rinsed gently three times with DI water. And then finally, a plastic beaker of KOH was heated until the internal temperature was 40 degrees Celsius. And then the cassettes were soaked in there for an hour and then soaked at room temperature for another 20 hours. So once this was done, um, a few samples were pulled out and rinsed with DI water once again to view under a mic microscope to make sure that um, no further clearing was necessary. And then after this, a one liter solution of 5% vinegar and 5% ink was heated to a boil. And then the roots were added to the boiling solution for three minutes and then um, trans uh, transferred to a bucket of acidified DI water to get rid of the excess ink. And then um, the roots were either stored in two ways. One, they were stored in acidified DI water for a few days in a cold room, 
or they were stored in acidic glycerol for um, long-term storage. So the next step in the process is mounting the slides and mounting the slides is a more difficult process than it seems because of how much variability is present. And so we chose two different patterns to try and see which one would be detected by the microscope software better. So if you look at the swirl pattern, the roots were a lot closer together and they risked overlapping some segments. And we came to find out that this setup did not work as well with the auto detection settings. And then on the other hand, the straight pattern was detected more easily by the microscope, but the roots were more spread out and which requires each sample to use more slides. So once the slides are mounted, they're ready to go into the microscope where they will encounter a series of parameters. Um, and these are important because even if you mount all the slides with the same pattern, there's still a lot of variation present because of the thickness and the size of the roots. And so by optimizing each parameter in such a way, we hope it can accurately depict the AMF colonization in the roots despite the huge variability in each slide. So the first parameter is the sample detection setting, which is responsible for determining the border of the area of in interest to be imaged, which in our case is just the roots. And so if you look to the left, the um, auto detection method outlines the roots in green. And then the microscope will lay out a coarse focus map, which is a strategy that lays out the points of where the microscope will focus its images. Um, and this is seen with the red blocks, which are around each coarse focus point that was applied to the, the slide. And then the final parameter is known as the fine focus map, which just applies more focus points for the microscope to focus on. But these points are dependent upon where the coarse focus points were laid out. Um, and those are shown with, in the images with the blue boxes. And then to produce the final image, the microscope takes all of the images it took and then stitches them together. So like I said before, the straight pattern did better with the auto detection settings and that is because of the borders it chose. So if you look into the zoomed in region of the swirl pattern, it's auto detection enclosed roots with a large area of white space rather than hugging each root individually. And this is important because when the software goes to lay out the course and find focus points, um, those points can be located in the white area rather than over the root, which is going to affect the clarity. And so this is shown in the images furthest on the right. Um, the course and find focus points were distributed mainly over the white space in the center of the image rather than the actual root. And so if you look at the top image, that whole section of the root um, is very out of focus and has poor clarity. So then once the appropriate pattern was determined, the next step was to optimize the coarse and fine focus parameters. And so this was tested by creating three different profiles that varied the maps for each to determine if there would be a noticeable difference in clarity. And so an important factor to consider, since this is a large scale project, is the effect of the coarse and fine focus points with respect to time. So by increasing the number of focus points, it can dramatically increase the clarity of the image, but it also increases the amount of time taken to image that slide. So we have to find a balance between getting enough clarity and a short enough time per slide. Um, and so all three prof profiles had a 10x magnification, but the first profile 1.6 um, had a coarse map profile named AMF Sorghum Light Microscope 4. And so this profile varies the location of the coarse focus points based on the size of the root. So if the root is anywhere from zero to one millimeter squared, that segment will get two focus points. If the segment is over 10, or if the root is anywhere from one to 10 millimeters squared, then that segment will get eight focus points. And if the segment is over 10, then that segment will get 12 focus points. And so this allowed us to 
maximize time by proportionally adding the amount of focus points to the size of the segment. And so you can see this um, in the images below the 1.6 profile because all the segments range from 1 to 10, and so they each received eight focus points. Um, and then for the fine focus points, the map profile is also the same, so the number of coarse and fine focus points are the same between the two. And then for the next profile, um, profile 1.7, the coarse map profile is known as AMF Sorghum Light Microscope 3, and it's also based on the size of the segment. But instead, if the segment is 0 to 1, the segment will get two focus points. If it's 1 to 10, the segment will get four focus points. And if it's larger than 10, it will receive eight. Um, and then the decrease in the coarse focus points was accounted for by using the AMF sorghum light microscope 4 profile um, for the fine focus, which doubles the number just to make sure that enough area is covered. Um, and so by doing that, it ensured that there were enough points for the image to have enough clarity, but also maximizes time. And then the last scan profile, 1.8, has a coarse focus point profile that is a measure of density. So each segment will have 0.4 of it covered by coarse focus points. And then the fine focus map profile is known as onion skin, which basically just means that it starts at the center and it circles outward. As it circles outward, a focus point will be placed. And then these three profiles were applied to the same slide and the clarity of the image was analyzed. So on this slide, I focused on an area of the root that was heavily colonized by AMF. And between three profiles, there is not much difference in the clarity of the image. Um, and this is most likely due to the fact that between the coarse and fine focus points, the number was relatively the same and they were all spread out evenly. Um, and overall, just not, not even in this segment, the images had good clarity. But because of the high variability that can occur um, during mounting the slides, the next sample might not have as good clarity, which is kind of seen on the next slide. So this is another slide that was run with the 1.8 profile. And while the clarity in the original image is better than the clarity produced with the swirl pattern, um, I think it's really important for the areas with AMF to be as clear as possible. So I went back and looked at the coarse and fine focus maps that produce this image. And on the coarse focus map, one of the um, focus points was off the root slightly over the white area, which would cause the clarity to decrease. Um, and so this was probably happened during the mounting slide. You can kind of see the white area in between the branch out and the main root. And so I went back and fixed this fine focus point by just moving it in to slightly focus on the root, and the clarity did increase slightly, as you can see, a more concentrated region of AMF. So while you can correct focus points that are shifted slightly off the root, this is also a time-consuming process to edit each slide. So we wanted a procedure that would allow us to avoid doing that. And based on the parameters of the microscope, um, I think the best way to optimize the image output and time would to be use any one of these profiles along with very careful mounting of the slides. So when mounting the slides, it's important to make sure that no roots are overlapping and that all of the branches are laid out um, straight so that the auto detection system can clearly outline just the roots. And so by doing so, the course fine focus points will only focus on the root rather than the background. Um, and so this data will be useful for a large scale project because it offers a way to quantify AMF colonization of roots, which can be used to determine what environmental conditions or genotypes help promote that colonization. So that's something to look forward to. And I would just like to thank um, the grant and then Dr. Arnold and Shufan for um, always answering my questions and helping me along. Thank you for the wonderful talk, and we're always glad to answer questions. Um, I, if you have questions in the audience, you're welcome to hit the text at the bottom, ask the speaker a question. And so I, I'm just going to give you a little time to type in. 
something. For salmon. I'm sorry, what was that? Oh, okay. Did, did you use Z stacking in any of the workflows that uh, you examined? Um, no. So Z stacking okay. would greatly increase the time to image okay. one slide by a significant amount because it would okay. basically take multiple pictures at each location. Uh -huh. And so um, because it's a large scale project and each all of the samples mm -hmm. need to be processed, we did not look at looking or okay. using Z stack. So, yeah. So um, have um, do you think you would gain anything by like shifting to 20x magnification instead of 10x? Have you played around with that at all? I think the difference in clarity wasn't a significant amount, not uh -huh. enough to actually change it because by using 20x, uh -huh. it did also increase the time by a lot. So okay. I just don't think the difference was significant enough. Okay. And uh, let's see, I was going to uh, the, how does, how does the protocol you've come up with for preparing the roots compare with the classical McGonagall pro protocol for laying out the little roots for images? for imaging? So by, um, it worked with the auto detection method a lot uh -huh. better because it got rid of the regions in the slide that are not occupied by a root. And so uh -huh. when the microscope lays out the focus points, which is where the images uh -huh. are gonna be taken, mm -hmm. um, it's only focusing strictly on the root and not anything else. Okay, okay. Well, thank you very much. Wonderful talk. And uh, I look forward to continue to working with you. Thank you. And so our next uh, speaker is Jalen Scott. He's from Jacksonville State uh, University. And uh, he has come with a very a strong interest in marine sciences. Mm -hmm. And so it's still gonna have a microbial flavor to it, uh, but it's gonna be in a very different habitat. And so it's my pleasure to introduce Jalen Scott, and he'll be examining the diversity of microbial uh, uh, microbes in uh, seagrass habitats. And I do encourage you to put in questions as he talks, uh, and you can just, hit the, the, the text question for the speaker. It'll, it'll pop up at the end. So you please use that option. Welcome, Jalen. Thank you, Dr. Arnold. All right, well, uh, today I'm gonna to be talking about examining the diversity of microbial invertebrates and seagrass habitats. So, uh, so a little background about seagrass. Um, seagrass appears on every continent except for Antarctica, so it's pretty abundant. Uh, they're staple food sources for marine life. They absorb carbon around them, which there's a little diagram in the bottom left right there uh, showing the sequestr sequestration of carbon. And they support up to 40,000 fish and invertebrates per acre. And of course, they produce a ton of oxygen. So uh, the reason we're focusing on seagrass is because the area that we were working in is an area called Bodega Bay, which is located in California. And on the right, there is a map of all of the samples we took. So we took, in total, we took six samples from three different locations and in two different habitats. So those locations are Mason's Marina in the top, West Side Park, West Side Park in the middle, and then Campbell Cove at the bottom. Uh, here's our objective. Uh, we are trying to examine and compare the functional ecology and the diversity of the sediments from Bodega Bay, of course. And we use two different habitats that we're comparing. So, of course, we use seagrass, as I spoke of earlier, and uh, bare mudflats or bare sediments, which 
doesn't necessarily mean there isn't any seagrass, but that there's very little. Just want to make that clear. Uh, for our method section, here we have, I guess, the protocol we use in order to extract our samples and to sequence them. So we use 96 samples per habitat with 192 in total. We, we had a couple of controls in there. Uh, we extracted them using raw sediment, which means we basically just put them in the tube and then try to um, sequence them without messing with it or anything. And we used three replicates per sample, just for clarity. And we were trying to amplify the hypervariable region of the 18S RNA gene. So uh, looking at the little diagram on the left, uh, I we had to grab the taxonomy from each invertebrate. It took a little while, but it was done. Uh, here are our locations. Here are the photos. So Mason's Arena is on the left. As you can see, it's pretty bare. There's not a lot of seagrass there. Uh, in the middle, we have Campbell Cove with a little bit of seagrass. And then on the far right, there's Westside Park with also a little, a little more seagrass, but uh, what do I plan to see? Um, well, enough for number one, we plan to see a distinction in nematode distribution. And for our second uh, point, we want to see a community contrast between the two habitats, which I'm sure you're wondering about those nematodes and where that came from. Uh, so we ended up choosing nematodes simply because they're very abundant in sediment. Uh, there's they're free. We chose free living ones. There are parasitic nematodes, but we decided to use the free living ones. And they are very good, reliable bioindicators. So they do, since they can't move very fast or really a lot, uh, if there's, you know, a disturbance in a different location, they show that very well. Uh, here is the sequencing death per habitat. Uh, for, let me see, uh, for each habitat, so there's BS, which is bare sediment, and then seagrass on the x-axis, and then on the y-axis, there is a number of reads uh, per location. Uh, we decided to use the Kruskal-Wallis test, which basically sh makes it easier to see if there's a significant difference between each habitat or location, in which the values are pretty high, so there isn't much of a um, difference between the habitats and the reeds, which is good because that means there's a you know pretty fair starting point and that we don't have any kind of skewing of the data off immediately. And moving on, we measured the alpha diversity. And on the left, we have we measured Simpson diversity, which is a type of diversity measure that isn't exactly equal, it gives more weight to taxonomy that show up more often. So it's not exactly a pure equal indicator, but looking at it, uh, there is a significant difference in the West Side Park and the Campbell Cove uh, locations. And moving on to our right, we have Shannon diversity, which it assumes every species is present and they're equally sampled. So it doesn't exactly, how do I say this? It doesn't exactly give different weight to different samples or different taxa. So this is a way more equal <laughs> equal example of this and once again the west side park and the campbell co locations were significantly different which is also good because that means if it's equal between simpson and shannon we didn't make any mistakes so there's continuity uh moving on to our non-metric multi-dimensional scale here um here is by location of course uh the numbers on the bottom don't mean anything they're just there I should mention that. So looking at Campbell Cove, you know, uh, there's a difference between the different habitats, which the closer the points are together is the more similar they are. So of course, the bare sediment are closer together and then the seagrass are in their own little section. But if you look at Mason's Marina, there seems to be, you know, they're closer together. So clearly there seems to be a, a similarity between both habitats, which there could be a variety of factors for this, you know, maybe since Mesa's Arena is closer to the docks and the beaches, there could be the human interference. But uh, moving on to West Side Park, there's the same trend from Campbell Cove. Uh, seagrass is 
little is in its own little pocket as well as bare sediment, even though bare sediment's a little spread out, but and here is the general taxonomy makeup of all of the samples. So this is just simply uh everything that showed up uh, in the habitats and the locations. So the habitats are on the top and the locations are on the bottom, starting from Mesa's Arena. And then on the y-axis, we have the abundance of reeds. And you can see that nematodes are showing up the most, which is what we want, because as I said, there are abundant in most uh, marine ecosystems. Uh, so we're moving on to the phylum level and nematodes are showing up once again the most uh but look going away from nematodes uh the diversity between the bare sediment and the seagrass you can see there isn't much of a difference between that um which is kind of weird we that's not what we expected of course but it is quite a shock but it does make sense and here is specifically the nematode distribution of all of the taxonomy so in the light, I guess, sea foam color is the uh, nematodes, is the main nematode. Uh, once again, here, the diversity seems to be just about the same between bare sediment and seagrass. However, looking at the locations, there seems to be a, you know, a bit of a difference or a variation, more specifically, West Side Park. So uh, looking at our conclusions, it appears that C4 ecosystem is affected by seagrasses. They didn't have higher diversity than its bare counterpart, but it seems rather that specific communities seem to show up in these locations uh, given by the second conclusion, which states that there was no clear contrast between the distribution of nematodes between locations. I'm sorry, between habitats, but rather between locations, which that's that makes sense. It's not too, it's a little disappointing that, you know, we didn't, we didn't get it right, but you know, it's science. Uh, I would like to thank everyone in the big lab, uh, especially Holly, uh, Tiago, Mariana, and Alejandro and Hunter for answering every question I asked, regardless of how dumb it was. And of course, uh, Patricia for, she was the one who did most of this, uh, the sequencing for us. And it, cause it took her a long time to get all of this data back. And that's about it. Thank you. What a wonderful talk. I, again, uh, you can put uh, questions uh, up for the speaker by ask a question text at the bottom. Just click on it. And uh, I'm sure J uh, Jalen would be glad to answer it. And while you're thinking about that, I'll, I'll just ask a few questions. Uh, do, do, does the seagrass have a a difference in response to salinity? I mean, is there, what, what's the factor that some places it's not doing so well and other places it, like the, the one on the right, uh, it, it seems to be pretty solid there. Yeah. So uh, are you speaking you know, of Westside Park or? Yeah. I mean, what is there, are there physical factors about the water or something that, uh, that favors the, the seagrass uh, environment, which uh, is well, housing the nematodes, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, looking at the data, it doesn't appear so, considering Campbell Cove is, of course, closer to the ocean, so it would have a higher yeah. salinity. But, okay. uh, I mean, looking at the data, it doesn't seem as if it really okay. matters to the seagrass. Okay, okay. So... Um, did you, uh, I'll just ask another question. Did you actually get to go on the field trip? Uh, no. Oh, it took a very, it took a very long time to get all these samples. Oh, okay. And okay. I don't think we, we wouldn't have had enough time anyway with this summer, uh, just right. two months. Okay. I was just, I was just curious. Um, now Bodega Bay, that's, that's in Northern California. Is that right? Uh, it's about in the middle. Uh, in southwest. the middle part. Okay. Southwest on the on the. Coast. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So, um, so what what was the the most exciting part of this?
project for you? Uh, probably the coding, definitely. Cause I'm oh, not, okay. I've never really been a computer uh, person, but I uh -huh. had had to learn so, okay. this summer. So, and it was a little, it hurt, but it's really uh -huh. nice to learn new things and see it come together. And were the most of the analyses you did were they in R or? Uh, yes, R Studio. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that that's exciting. Oh well. Hopefully you'll get to go on one of these trips too. I hope so. That, it does sound fun. <laughs> it does sound wonderful. Okay. So um, I think we'll, we'll move to our uh, next speaker. And again, this is Oriana Bolts. And uh, again, if you have questions, you think you have questions, you know, you can just hit the, the text at the bottom, ask the question ask the speaker and uh, it will show up at the end of the presentation. Um, uh, Oriana Bolts is from the University of South Carolina Beaufort and she is using some new nanotechnology to understand and dissect uh, the symbiosis between our buscular mycorrhizal fungi and sorghum or AMF for short and it's my pleasure to introduce her and uh, and welcome Ariana. Hi everybody. Um, I just want to say today has been an amazing day and all of the amazing pre presenters today have just been wonderful and hopefully I do a good job of wrapping it up. So once again my name is Oriana Bolds and today I'll be talking about using quantum dots to track nutrient exchange between AMF and sorghum by color. A bit of background, AMF stands for Arbuscule Mycorrhizal Fungi. And by fungi, once again, I don't mean mushrooms, I mean this. So Arbuscule Mycorrhizal Fungi forms a mutualistic relationship between plants and it invades the plant's roots and then takes over the cell and creates arbuscules. And this is the source of nutrient exchange and it gives the plant nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus as well as increased protection against pathogen. And in exchange, the AM, in exchange, the AMF gets carbon, lipids, as well as sugars. Uh, this symbiosis occurs in about 80% of vascular plant families and dates back to about 400 million years ago. And so here is just another picture showing the um, mature abuscules and once again, the exchange that happens between the plants. Quantum dots. So quantum dots are fluorescent nanometer sized crystals with a core and shell composed of semiconductors. And semiconductors are materials that possess properties in between being easily conductible, uh, conducting electricity, otherwise known as conductors, as well as not easily conducting electricity, known as insulators. And here the semiconductors in this quantum dot is copper, indium, zinc, and sulfide. What's really interesting about quantum dots themselves is that they are really tunable. So the emission color that they you know, give off is reliant on their size. And we have the opportunity to change their size, which means that we can change their color anywhere from red to blue and anything in between, which is something that is very applicable and, and something that is very desired in fluorescent imaging as well as tracking diseases. So this is becoming an up and coming fluorophore to track um, exchanges. And the next thing I'm gonna talk about is sorghum bicolor. And sorghum bicolor is a cereal grass that approximately 300 million people depend on as a source of nutrients. Um, sorghum bicolor is a very hardy plant. It can grow in a wide range of temperatures and altitudes as well as being resistant to toxicity and drought. Um, sorghum bicolor also, there's a lot of literature surrounding sorghum bicolor and AMF, but there's not a lot surrounding how to track or if they've ever tracked the nutrient exchange. And so that is why we have the question, are essential nutrients like nitrogen absorbed, how, how are essential nutrients like nitrogen absorbed and distributed from AMF in the plant roots to sorghum to the sorghum plant? And in order to figure this out, we first needed to figure out what we're going to attached to nitrogen in order to mark it. And I talking earlier, I talked about quantum dots. And so we decided that that was going to be our marker and that we needed to figure out what we were going to attach the quantum dots to in order to track nitrogen and how are we going to get the quantum dot into the plant um, so that AMF can uptake this. 
So our PI provided us a paper called The Brighter Side of Soil by Matthew D. Whiteside. And in this paper, Whiteside talks about conjugating quantum dots to arginine and glycine. And arginine and glycine are amino acids that are precursors to nitrogen. And the word conjugation just means to attach. So what we're trying to do here, or what Whiteside did here, was take the quantum dot um, and through conjugation, attach the arginine to the quantum dot so that way we could track organic nitrogen in the plant. So after deciphering his paper, we came up with a process of conjugation. And in that process, we made one liter of buffer, which contained 10 millimoles of whatever the solutes were. And 10 millimoles per liter is just a concentration. So in each, um, in each liter, there is the exact amount of concentration. And then we split the buffer into two. We'd add arginine into one buffer and then glycine into the other. We would then measure out 10 milliliters of the buffer solution then add in 43.2 microliters of quantum dots to the buffers, and then we'd quickly add in EDC, and this is because EDC is what's going to cause this kind of reaction and, and get the process of conjugation going. Then we place it on a shaker for three hours in the dark, and though quantum dots themselves are resistant to photo, photo bleaching, they are still light sensitive, so a lot of the process that we did here was all performed in the dark. And then after that, we had placed the solutions on a UV light in order to see fluorescence and get a good understanding of what's happening with the solution before the second half of the experiment took place. And the process of making a buffer, we added 800 milliliters of deionized water. And then we would add the solutes in. In this case, I think this is sodium borate. And then we would add in the rest of the water, filling it up to one liter. Now, I never really talked about what buffer we use, and that's because during the first half of this experiment, we were trying to figure out what would give us the brightest solution that we could possibly make. Um, in Whiteside's paper, he uses a borate buffer, but does not talk about the components of the borate buffer. And so we decided to use a sodium borate buffer, and the components of this buffer is boric acid, sodium chloride, and sodium tetraborate. We then follow the same exact procedure as I mentioned beforehand, placing it on a shaker in the dark for three hours and then placing it on a UV light. And this is what we came up with. Now, the photo itself is a little blurry, but on the left is glycine and on the right is arginine. Now you can see that glycine is a purplish color and a little bit more translucent. It's not really giving off or emitting any light. And this was something that was of concern to us. We were like, we should be seeing a, a more fluorescent, even, even from arginine, we should see something more fluorescent. Um, and so we made two fatal flaws in this sort of, uh, what you can probably see here is I mentioned earlier about using 10 milliliters and this is not 10 milli milliliters. We used way too much of the buffer solution. Um, and so we had to draw that back and rescale that. And once we redid that, um, I don't have a picture of it right now, but once we redid that, the results were still the same. It was still kind of translucent, barely giving off any fluorescence. And so we went back to the literature again, looked through, and then we came across this phenomenon called fluorescent quenching. And what happens is when two kind of molecules are put next to each other, and one that is fluorescent and one that isn't, there's a process, there's a chance that the fluorescence will be quenched, and therefore it will just not emit as much as it should. And that is what we think was happening, and it seems that sodium or any other electrolyte is the major um, cause of this phenomenon. So we decided to remove sodium from our borate buffer and just went with a sodium tetraboric and boric acid. And when we had to change the pH, we made sure to not use uh, hydro hydrochloric acid um, so we couldn't make salt. So that's what happened. We placed it on the shaker for three hours again, UV light. And this is what we came up with. So in this case, the two middle bottles in the left is arginine, on the right is glycine, and in the bigger bottles it still follows left arginine, right glycine. Now, once again, it's a little bit harder to see here, but the two middle, two solutions in the middle that don't have um, any electrolytes seem to be shining a little bit brighter with arginine shining just a teeny bit more than glycine was. And so it was at this point we were like, okay, we're gonna use this, but then we received some information from the manufacturer of the quantum dots and they advised us to use phosphate because of the literature surrounding that that said that phosphate was just a good solution um, as well as they thought that quenching was indeed happening, but they believed that it was because the arginine that we were using was 
too much. So we had to scale it back to only be about three times in respect to the quantum dots. And so we did that phosphate buffer contained the sodium phosphate dibasic heptahydrate, as well as sodium base, uh, phosphate monobasic monohydrate. Uh, we placed it on the shaker for three hours, placed it on UV light, and this is what happened. So it's a really bright solution. This is what we were looking for all along. Um, very thankful for the help. And then uh, we took the solution, we placed it in the uh, 4C room just to keep it at an optimum temperature while we conducted our experimental design. So our experimental design, uh, we wanted to take the three solutions that we had made and see how we could visualize them in the root. So the first way we were going to get it uptaken into the root, because I had mentioned this before, the first way we were going to get it uptaken into the root was to splurge the solution onto the plant leaf. And this was taken from a paper by Alvon. And in that paper, they used uh, gold nanoparticles and sprayed them on to their plants and saw about a 5% of the spray ended up in the roots. And so we took that idea and sort of ran with it. And then we used a drip solution, which was mentioned in Whiteside's paper that we had previously based our process of conjugation on. Uh, and in that paper, he took a bit of the plant in a test tube with some dirt and some AMF, and then he would strip the, drip the quantum dot solution onto the plant, well, onto the soil, and then have the plant root uptake it. And then we needed to image using the confocal microscope. And so this is my favorite part. Here are some images. So on the left, here is the laser image of the quantum dot, of, of the arginine quantum dot and borate buffer. And if you can kind of see, there are some tiny dots floating around and that is the quantum dot. Um, I will say, just don't mind that big pink blob there. That is just a smudge, nothing too much more than that. In the middle, we have under bright field, which is just the typical kind of way of viewing under a microscope. And then we have them layered on top of each other. And then here is the maximum intensity, intensity projection, otherwise known as the Z-stack, of the boy buffer with arginine quantum dots. And here we can see more uh, quantum dots sort of appear. And what happened here is the images are layered on top of each other. So we can see each individual layer of the root and then compile them all together to give us a concise imaging. So here is the arginine quantum dots and sodium bore buffer. There are, I don't, I wouldn't say more, but there are, there tends to be, it, there tends to be this intensity of quantum dots on the edges. And I believe that that is because when argin, when the AMF uptakes the, um, when AMF uptakes nitrogen, it kind of forms uh, arginine naturally. And so what I believe is happening is that arginine quantum dots are gravitating towards other arginine that's already present in the root. So here's some more pictures. Here's the sodium phosphate buffer. And then here we just did a control of quantum dots and deionized water. Um, and then here's what that looks like, very bright, as I would kind of imagine from being unconjugated. And some future plans that we have, what we really want to do is to confirm um, quantum, dot, quantum dot conjugation. And a suggested way of doing this was to form thin layer chromatography. So that way we can see each separate layer of all of the components. So the Bori buffer or the buffers, and then what would be the arginine, and then quantum dot, unconjugated quantum dot, and then what would be conjugated quantum dot. Um, which is one way of, we can do that. And then a temporal study, which we could track nitrogen or any, um, track nitrogen over time. Uh, and then the other would be comparing nutrient rich versus nutrient poor soil and how AMF dictates um, where the nitrogen will go or where any other nutrient will go. And then of course, different nutrients that we can look into. So I just wanted to thank Everybody who has helped me thus far, Dr. Jonathan Arnold, Chufan, um, Gia, as well as Anna and William, who really helped, you know, this project become what it is, as well as non -port. That's a wonderful work. So 
when when you just added the nanodots by themselves uh, on, on the what what happened there so you just have the little punctate things you or is that the it, that's the control there right so this is the control yes so all yeah. we did was we followed sort of the same procedure except we didn't use any boy buffer didn't use any arginine uh -huh. just the quantum dots by itself to see what was the difference and one major difference i see is that it's brighter and it kind of just appears anywhere uh -huh. or instead right. of like forming on the outside like the others do uh-huh and and so i'm just going to mention to anyone if you have questions just hit the the uh the little button ask the speaker at the bottom of your of your screen and she'll answer them uh, the, the the other thing i was interested in so uh you guys are still planning to uh i guess uh try try adding the quantum dots uh in the soil or to the uh it, you know through the roots at some point i guess yeah so we had some we had done the procedure it's just the imaging was taking quite a bit of time to kind of work there was a different uh -huh. um clearing procedure for the roots it was a little bit harder right. i think with the soil being dripped and kind of clung to the roots so we were having problems right. imaging and getting a clear sort of information about that I, I have a comment uh, for you. It's not a question, and the question, yeah, I, I think it's on the screen. Not a question, but I really like the images that you showed, very informative and fascinating. So yeah, you have an incredible amount of detail in the images, which is, uh, is amazing. Oh, and here, and somebody is coming with a question too. So, but here it is. Great talk, Oriana. I may have missed it, but why do you think having it in deionized water helps to reduce the fluorescence seen in the background? How did, yes, so they're asking about the deionized water uh, to help in the, your imaging. To help in the overall imaging? So deionized water doesn't really help with imaging. It just, as I talked before about electrolytes, um, mm -hmm. causing fluoresce, um, causing this sort of quenching, quenching process. Um, the, the ionized water will kind of help with um, any added mm -hmm. electrolytes. And so we can then sort of decrease the chances mm -hmm. of fluorescent quenching. Okay. And I had a, one more question. Uh, did you guys find any ways of, you know, you've talked about following the nitrogen and up through the roots, uh, one thing I, if Nancy was here, she'd probably ask this question, is what's the chance of being able to follow the carbon down uh, into the roots from you know the photosynthesis? Are there any c conjugate nanodots you can create that would take a sugar? So taking a sugar, I would imagine so. So the yeah. amazing thing about quantum dots is that as long as you can find something that sort of correlates, like in this case, we didn't necessarily attach nitrogen, but precursors right. to nitrogen themselves, and entered into the plant, it was able to sort of attach itself to where it needed to go. So right. as long as you could find something that would be able to be attached to, um, I think okay. it would be fine. Okay. Well, thank you all of you for this wonderful series of presentations it was fantastic it, it was really a broad broad stroke and of biology and bioinformatics and you're all to be commended for this wonderful work that you've done this summer and uh, uh, I'll, I'll make doubly sure that nsf make, sees all of this wonderful work so Thank you again, and uh, and and we are so glad that we had this uh, ten weeks together. Thank you.